Um, yes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, if I could have your attention. And if I could have members of the committee taking their seats. Great. Uh, welcome uh, to meeting four of the Planning and Housing Committee. Welcome to the members of the committee, uh, to members of council uh, in attendance, and to the members of the public. For those in the room with us, the screen at the back of the room provides real-time updates concerning where we are in the agenda and what's coming up next. You can follow the agenda and the debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. We acknowledge the land we are meeting. Um, we are meeting on is the traditional territory of Mary Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, Unashani, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Metis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And now I call for any declarations of interest under the Municipal of Conflict of Interest Act. Seeing none, members, I want to take a moment to remind you that when you declare an interest under Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, you are now also required to file a written declaration with the clerk. The clerk has provided blank forms to every member's office, and I ask that you complete and bring them with you to meetings each time you declare an interest. If you forget to bring your form, the clerk's, has staff, and, uh, the clerk's staff can provide you with one, which you should complete and submit before the end of the meeting. If you need more information on your obligations under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, I would refer you to the Integrity Commissioner's Interpretation Bulletin. I believe the clerk has a few copies as well. And if you require advice, I encourage you to reach out to the Integrity Commissioner directly. Okay, can I have a motion to confirm the minutes of the meeting of March 20, 2019? Councillor Wong Tam, all those in favor, that carries. Uh, now let's look through, go through uh, the agenda. Item 4.1, Don Mills Crossing Final Report. There's deputants. Item 4.2, Toronto Heritage Grant Awards. 
Councillor Fletcher moved that, moves that. All those in favor? That carries. Item 4.3, Golden Mile Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we won't be able to, we can't deal with it until 10 a.m. Uh, but I have acknowledged that we will vary the order of paper if uh, is the will of the committee to have uh, the Golden Mile right after Don Mills because the members that have interest have civic appointments committee. So uh, Golden Mile Secondary Plan Study Proposed Boundary Expansion and Status Report, that's item 4.3 and that will follow item 4.1. Item 4.4, uh, official plan review, draft transportation policies and consultations. There's speakers on that. And item 4.5, committee of adjustment, panel size and structures. There's also speakers on that. So, so with that, we will this, start. This item, we have four minutes before we get started on the Oh. So um, we have four minutes uh, that we can't start uh, item 4.1 uh, until 9.45. Uh, if the will of the committee, we can deal with uh, the Golden Mine sec Mile Secondary Plan. Is that okay? So we'll start with that one. And uh, speakers, we'll start with speakers on, and I remind, uh, just one more time, we're now starting with item 4.3, that's Golden Mile Secondary Plan Study, Proposed Boundary Expansion and Status Report. And uh, we have a speaker, um, Hisham Al-Ashbashi. That person here? I don't believe he is. So seeing that is not here, is there anybody else that would like to make deputation on this item? Okay, please join us at the front. Good morning. You have, and just uh, to confirm, this is for the Golden Mile yep. item. Great, thank you. Go ahead, you have five minutes and the clock is right there. Thank you. So my name is Michael Vanny. I'm a planner with the Weston Consulting Group. I'm here on behalf of the owners of 1460 Victoria Park Avenue, um, Vitmont Holdings, Vic Park, Inc. We had submitted applications for rezoning last year, which was deemed complete um, about a month ago. Um, this is one of the uh, properties that's proposed to be added to the secondary plan area. We just have some concerns in terms of that property being added to the secondary plan area and what that would do to our application that's currently in process. Our application is just a rezoning and will be a future site plan and condominium application. It is consistent with the official plan. We have considered the applicable O'Connor design guidelines in the area and we just want to ensure that moving forward um, it is our preference not to be within the Golden Mile Secondary Plan area. If we had to be added, we would want to ensure that the processing and the, of that secondary plan expansion would not affect the processing of our application. That's it. Okay. Questions of the deputant? What address? 1460 Victoria Park. It's oh, on the, that's uh, the site that's been vacant for like 20 years? Yeah. And, and you've got an application for... There's an application in process right now. It's a 106-unit, uh, um, nine-story condominium building with retail at grade. Does the, does the new road go through your property? Um, no. There is, um, to the north side, there is the potential for um, pedestrian connections as part of the um, urban design guidelines for O'Connor. Okay, uh, any further questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you. And uh, we do have one additional speaker. Uh, uh, Ebony Menzies. Ebony? No, not here as well, okay. No further deputations on this item. Questions of staff? Councillor Denzel Minimum, uh, Deputy Mayor. Can staff put up a, a diagram of the, what they're considering? It's 
we'll, uh, Madam Speaker, we'll do that. Take a moment. Do you have any further questions? Well, uh, yeah, well, uh, no, I mean, all of it uh, uh, stems or from needing to look at the diagram. I Actually, I think it's remarkable that we didn't, I don't come to this committee often, Madam Chairman, but a big thing like this, I'm surprised that there's not a staff presentation to begin with because it's a massive undertaking. I, I think you know, Councillor Crawford would agree with that. Anyway, I is, can we staff do a presentation? You want a staff presentation on this? Could uh, staff? We we have a short presentation. This this is a one of many reports on Golden Mile, so we're we're not at a milestone decision point yet, um, but we're certainly prepared to give you an update on where we are with the process. Yes. So this is not the final report on no, one of the milestones. It is okay. not. Will the committee be interested in uh, an update, a brief presentation from staff? We're happy, quite happy to give that, yes. Okay, let's do it. Okay. okay. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Emily Caldwell. I am a planner in Scarborough, and I am the planning lead for the Golden Mile Secondary Plan Study. We have a brief presentation for you today regarding uh, the report that's before you today. So just in terms of a bit of background, most of you will be familiar with the fact that in May 2014, City Council adopted the Eglinton Connects planning study and directed city planning staff to further study the six focus areas along the Eglinton corridor, including the Golden Mile. So there are two components of that study. The first was the Golden Mile market analysis and economic strategy study, and that was completed in December of 2016. And then what is before you today is the Golden Mile Secondary Plan study, which is in phase three, which commenced in 2017. As you can see from this map, these are the five surface LRT stations for the Eglinton uh, Connects area for the LRT uh, that run through the Golden Mile area. This is the existing study area boundary for the Golden Mile Secondary Plan study. So it's the lands between Victoria Park to the west and Birchmount to the east, and the lands generally fronting on the north and south side of Eglinton. And it does extend north to Ashtonby. In terms of some quick stats, the existing study area is 97 hectares in size and encompasses lands within wards 20 and 21. The residential component, which is much smaller, is 16 hectares approximately with approximately 650 people. So through this process, um, the study will identify a vision and comprehensive planning framework for the Golden Mile in advance of the opening of the LRT in 2021. The policies will include all of these things before you, but just a quick high-level uh, description, built form policies, public realm policies, transportation master plan, master servicing plan, urban design guidelines, and so on. So the Golden Mile Secondary Plan also has concurrent studies. There's the Transportation Master Plan, the TMP study, which is shown in those red boundaries, red-orange colors, so the much larger area. And then there's also the Community Infrastructure Study, looking at community services and facilities within the broader Golden Mile area. The existing official plan designations include mixed-use areas, shown in red, generally on the north side of Eglinton, with a few exceptions on the south side. The employment areas shown in purple on the south side of Eglinton, east of Pharmacy to Birchmount. Apartment neighborhoods in the northwest corner uh, shown in the orange color. And then there's a small component that is a designated neighborhoods. On the west side of Victoria Park, you can see that there's also um, several designations. So the lands that we will be discussing today are the mixed use areas lands. As I mentioned, we're in phase three of three for the study. We've had a number of community consultation meetings, which began in June of 2017. The last community consultation meeting was in June of 2018. That was for phase two. And what we have before you today is the summary of the work that was completed in phase two in the form of the alternatives report. So that is uh, before you today. And then we're also at the stage where we are proposing a boundary expansion. Following today's meeting, we are also, um, we will be bringing the final um, the draft preferred alternative to the community for community consultation number four. And then in Q3 of 2019, we anticipate the final report to City Council. 
Through the phase two process, we looked at three different uh, street and block alternatives. So this gives you a sense of the alternatives that we were exploring through that phase. Um, and two of those options, alternatives two and three, contemplated the potential realignment, reconfiguration of O'Connor Drive. This was presented to the community in June of 2018. So as a result of the preferred street and block alternative, three development uh, alternatives were presented also at the June Community Council meeting to look at different concentrations of density throughout the study area. This, is the emer this was the emerging street and block network that resulted from those three alternatives that I presented to you earlier. And we're looking at, um, again, that potential reconfiguration of O'Connor Drive to extend south of Eglinton. This is a quick summary of the big moves. So taking the work that was completed as part of phase two, uh, that work has been refined to um, add a, num a number of big moves throughout the Golden Mile study area. As you can see, if I go back one slide, the current um, blocks are quite large. The Golden Mile Boulevard, as we're calling it, would be a new east-west street north of Eglinton. So on, in this version, it's currently showing a jog at Hakimi. If I can, there, right in this location here. So that, that previous plan progressed to this, which shows a number of emerging uh, big moves. So because of those current um, large land holdings and a number of large former industrial blocks, now many of them mixed use, larger format retail, um, the focus would be on creating smaller blocks, enhancing the street and block network, reconfiguring existing streets where appropriate, and providing a range of block sizes. And then we're also looking at um, an emerging public realm strategy that would include enhancing the public realm network, which is currently very uh, car focused, uh, so not much public realm in that sense, with the introduction of um, some major parks to complement the existing parks. And um, those parks would range from large parks to smaller parks, pops, and connections to the Meadow Way, which is located north of the study area. So through the Hydro Corridor, those connections are one of the, the key, key points as well. And then the expansion of the existing Victoria Park, Eglinton Parkette, so that triangle um, at the intersection of Eglinton. It's the current intersection of Eglinton, Victoria Park, and Eglinton Square. The proposed boundary expansion are the lands shown in gray. Uh, so there would be sort of a regularized southern boundary between pharmacy and warden. And then there would be land, lands are currently, that are currently under application for the one Eglinton Square property also include some lands that are designated neighborhoods in this location. And we're proposing to include those lands as well as some of the lands along Victoria Park. That's within uh, wards 2020 currently. And then on the west side of Victoria Park, as I mentioned, the lands between uh, Eglinton, south to the, the boundary between the mixed use areas and the ap apartment neighborhoods to the south. Those are the additional lands that we are proposing to add to the study area. In terms of next steps, we are finalizing the built form and public realm strategies this month. Um, the technical advisory committee will be reconvening as well as the local advisory committee in probably May, early June. The community consultation meeting, that final meeting is anticipated for June of 2019. And the final consultant report, so as part of this process, we are working with a team of consultants. They are required to submit a final report summarizing their findings, and we will be bringing forward draft secondary policies as well. So that's expected to happen over the course of the summer, but certainly in July. And then the final report, as mentioned, Q3 2019. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so part of the, I guess, history process of this, and, and, and I'm going to, a couple questions is, number one, it, it, it had been really a, a Scarborough Community Council uh, secondary plan because it hit, went up to Victoria Park, the vast majority of this process, and it was just, I guess, last year when you looked at the alternatives, and I think it was primarily to do with the reconfiguration or potential reconfiguration of O'Connor that expanded the ward or expanded the uh, plan over to... Uh, I guess, uh, Councilman and Wong's. Um, is that so? The reason? Yes, it, that's correct. Okay. Um, 
Um, and I guess uh, just a question, just a clarification, just to understand how, how this uh, item ended up coming here because it, prim it was primarily all in Scarborough and, and, and in, it was Scarborough count, uh, Community Council. Uh, and just as a, a com, um, question to the Chief Planner, uh, Council passed last July um, a motion that said City Council direct the Chief Planner and Executive Director City Planning to retain the boundaries of the Golden Mile Secondary Plan Review Study as approved in items beginning in January 2018 and no alterations be permitted without direction and approval from Scarborough Community Council. So we did pass that at Council last year. Uh, as a, from a notice of motion, and it was passed to council. And, and what's, what's gonna, what should have said is that the decision should lie at Scarborough Community Council. But again, it's here today. So I just wanted the uh, chief planner to uh, sort of explain how it got here. Yes, through the, through the chair. So in the course of implementing that um, direction from Scarborough Community Council, uh, we consulted with the clerk. And in the, uh, uh, as, as was noted in the presentation, over the course of the fall, the, uh, the uh, geography on the west side of Victoria Park being pertinent to the ultimate recommendations um, in consultation with legal and the clerk, it was determined that um, our ultimate recommendations are going to straddle community council boundaries. Uh, so notwithstanding that we had that direction from Scarborough Community Council, uh, the procedural bylaw would call for the matter to be considered by Standing Committee, Planning and Housing now configured. And uh, so basically we wrote a report to come back here uh, to restart that conversation, mindful that we had that outstanding uh, you know, direction from Scarborough. So we're essentially seeking uh, go forward clarity from, from council on, on the matter being processed so in accordance with the procedural bylaw or if council determines in, uh, in some sort of other variation. So just to be clear, again, and this, it was a decision of council, not uh, community council last year. So that, that superseded, or the uh, procedural bylaw superseded the decision of council. Yes, in trying to advance that, we consulted the procedural Hence, that's bylaw. why that's good. Yes. Hence, that's why it's here. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Councilor Denzel, uh, Deputy Mayor Denzel Manuel. I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear you. What did you? This one? Sorry, now you can hear me better? That's perfect. Yeah, um, the first question is, you said there were, uh, there's been a number of community consultation meetings. So this, uh, this, um, how many meetings, w were the people, anyone in North York given notice of these meetings? Yes, they were. And were they told that the road was being re reconfigured or did it just say, um, we're, this has to do with the Scarborough secondary plan? So the three options, yes, the, there's two questions in there. This was the, the notification area for community consultation meeting number three, which happened in June of 2018, which yep. include lands on the west side of Victoria Park. Mm -hmm. At that meeting, we discussed these oh, no. three alternatives, Madam which Chair, show- Different question. Um, so, what was the notice? So what, Madam Chair, when, when someone gets a notice of a meeting who doesn't live in Scarborough, and, and there's a thing about the Scarborough, the Golden Mile Secondary Plan, they're gonna kind of throw it into the recycling unless you know, unless they know that uh, they send out a notice that says, in this plan, we are considering blasting through um, a new road down your street that's going to become an arterial road. That would be an opera. So I wouldn't go, my residents wouldn't go to the first meeting. They sure as heck would attend the second meeting. So I'm asking in the notice, was there specificity with regard to what was being done? It's, I mean, it's a, it's a, I think a really important question. There was discussion in the notice, yes, regarding the proposal. It wasn't in great detail because the idea is that uh, members of the public would come and see it at the meeting, yes. What was the title of the notice? I, is that unfair to ask you? No, and I can, um, there were two new meetings actually. There was a landowners meeting, so there was the Golden Mile landowners and business owners meeting to discuss the Golden Mile secondary plan study, and then there was, which was an open house and that was followed the same day by a community consultation meeting regarding the Golden Mile. Can you go back to that colored map that I was? The official plan map? Yeah. So let me get this straight. So what you're essentially doing is you're saying, 
straightening this out. This is a residential area, yes? Yes. So you're straightening this road out to go like this. And then, oh no, sorry, there's, there's going to be a new road that's going to go right through this neighborhood like this, and you're changing the trajectory of O'Connor Drive. So the O'Connor Drive would not extend west of its current location? It ends there currently. So the, the reconfiguration as contemplated would come through the mixed use area. The, it's not proposed. There would be a new road that lines up potentially as explored through this. Can I switch the map? This one maybe? Just bear with me, this one? So in terms of this road, is, is this the one we're referring to? This is Bartley. Yeah, this is a proposed road. This is the new one, right? So currently contemplated would be potentially a private road through there, and it may actually be an active connection. So it may not be for vehicular traffic at this point. It's not, there would not be a signal, a signal at this location. There would not be a signal at Bartley, no. I'm not familiar with that conversation, okay. however, and just, I'll leave to, it. Uh, just to supplement, these are, of course are all proposed. This is part of the proposal. So certainly the feedback from the committee and the community as we continue to develop these options, you know, is 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 certainly welcome as we as we move this forward. It's fair to say that's a big change for that area, right? Uh, it's a significant change for the entire area. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just if I could uh, also uh, assist the deputy mayor in his uh, question with respect to the notice, the notice uh, uh, we just pulled it up off of line because I don't think the planner uh, had it had it available. It was entitled Renew Golden Mile. And in the summary, because obviously the notice is one page, in the summary on the notice, um, there was a map. It did not show the proposed road network because of the condensed nature of the informa information. It did uh, summarize, however, that the consultation will be about uh, updating the status of the study, the emerging street and block network, uh, potential development alternatives. So again, it's a summary only. It is not the specifics. I just wanted to help the deputy mayor with this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher? Um, yes. Where was the meeting? The meeting that? The meeting was on pharmacy north of Ashton B. So just, just north of the Golden Mile area. Generally, this is pharmacy here, so it was approximately here. There are a number of meetings? There, that was the third meeting that was there, yeah. Where were the others? The other two? <clears throat> and it's, it's, in clear, it's, in the it's just off the map here. It would have been St. Clair just east of Victoria Park. Down in there, okay. And um, just questioning the, I guess I'm, when you put up the big map with all the zoning on it, if you could just go to that. The zoning or the official plan? Yeah. Back to the employment mixed use. Yeah, you can do that. Yes, I do. Map. There we go. So that was the, well, the former Golden Mile, which was in car dealerships and in the industry. So you've got a fair amount of employment zoning there, mixed use zoning. On the opposite side, you have an intact employment area because this is no longer, even though it's zoned employment, it's not an intact employment area. Can you confirm that? It's been redone. Well, it's been converted to big, big box. box retail on the south side, right. yes. North in, side mostly. There north, are some on the south side, but most of it is on the north side. There is quite a bit of employment still south of Eglinton. Still south of Eglinton. Yes. And south of Eglinton, well, I tend to go anyway. I'm not going, going into that. Oh. Um, so to me, we're really looking as well as employment features here. And what takes place on this side as far as traditional employment, maintaining high value jobs. Uh, I don't know if that's the intent of this study. Because yes, it looks uh, like a street grid. It doesn't look much like an employment area anymore when I see that. 
Yes, the, the concept is to continue to support that employment investment and also to now promote residential and mixed use identification in the appropriate locations. In, uh, accord, in accordance with the official plan designation. Official so we're not we're recommending not redesignation. redesignation. So that, that's the land use pattern, just to supplement. That's a land use pattern and superimposed with the street grid to improve connectivity and, and uh, cre create complete, uh, a complete transportation network. I see, but the pressure will be on, they'll be pressured to rezone right on the uh, Eglinton for everybody because it would be pressure for residential. So people are moving along Eglinton. You've got that's, to I mean, essentially that's with the advent of the uh, LRT. Yes. Um, that's the whole intent of the secondary plan is to get out in front. We've, we have had applications, there are a number of applications. Right. I, to get out in front I, and to shape and inform those applications. So we're just going to go back to, well, not that. That's who's in there. And where, what are you calling the employment south? Employment on the south side. Apologies, Councillor. What was the question? What type of employment is it on the south side? Currently, it's, uh, there's general employment um, fronting onto Eglinton and further south there's core employment. So where would you, so, and we'd say that technically the Bermondsey O'Connor uh, employment area is a core employment area. So I think I'm concerned about a spillover of pressure on the core employment and I'm wondering what you're doing to ensure that there is no spillover and an anticipation I'm going to ask the chief planner that there's no spillover in anticipation that with the LRT, which would allow residential in certain spots, that our core employment areas would be shifted. No, through the chair, there's no intent. In fact, that would be that would only be considered through the municipal comprehensive review. Uh, we are not uh, intending to uh, uh, recommend any changes to the underlying designations or the land use strategy. We're trying to work with the land use strategy. In fact, I would argue the secondary plan will bring greater certainty uh, and equip us more to deal with, you know, what those inevitable pressures will be. We're better off putting in place and directing um, the growth in a way that works with the LRT. Uh, in a proactive manner. Um, we're not going to deny that putting rapid transit will increase the pressure for a lot of residential and mixed use. Well, through that uh, will happen. It's just going to be there. It, it's inevitable, but through Emergency. through the chair, the major transit station areas uh, policies in the uh, in the growth plan seek uh, both residential and job density right. minimums, um, and we take the view that we can intensify jobs as well as intensifying residential across these transit corridors and that's that's the approach that we'll be taking so i am going to ask for economic development to be here because just because of the amount of employment that we're dealing with that considering we're dealing with two core employment areas because now the now the west side has been added in but this is a core employment area i'm having trouble understanding uh, why it would ever go to a community council and why it wouldn't be at the planning committee where all core employment matters are heard. I don't believe economic development are here. I don't know, Carrie, do you want to speak to this any further? I, I just need to have that second one answered because all of my employment areas are all here. Everything, including, yeah. So the uh, study is not intended to look at redesignating the lands. The, the study is being done in, in concert with the understanding of what Council has previously adopted under Official Plan Amendment 231. Certainly, I acknowledge, um, Councillor, as you have indicated, that when we come to do the next MCR, there will be pressure on all lands around transit, and we will have to do our due diligence and look at where we should be converting lands where it's appropriate, but also be putting in uh, policies again to protect for adjacent employment lands. And lastly, how, uh, because if this is, would be held at Scarborough, what special 
What special steps can be taken? Uh, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Chief Planner. What special steps can be taken to ensure of the engagement of all of those in Deputy Mayor's ward, which I believe was former Councillor Davis's ward? Um, what special steps would be taken? Are you anticipating? Should this go back to Scarborough Community Council? Uh, through the through the chair, uh, we've certainly given notice on the west side of, uh, of Victoria Park. Uh, we can uh, and be very happy to uh, sit with uh, the deputy mayor and look at the, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the consultation boundaries for the notice to, uh, to make sure that we've got the right geography uh, as the consultation continues. And then... Uh, if the matter was to continue at Scarborough Community Council, um, there likely is a way for um, a report to also be uh, produced for North York Community Council if there is a desire for that to take place so that North York Community Council can weigh in with whatever perspective it may have. So that, I mean, the difficulty will be that we can only have one statutory meeting. But I think if there's a way to fashion, and I understand there's been some discussion between the deputy mayor and the local councillors around how to fashion a process that would have some advice coming from the North York Community Council um, at that statutory meeting in a way that um, the input um, uh, can, can be managed. Excuse me. Uh, let's, is there a stakeholder group? You mentioned a land users group. There's a local advisory committee, which includes stakeholders, yes. And how many people are on that from Deputy Mayor's ward? That's a good question. I don't think there's any. I don't think any at current. So we have a little problem, don't we? They, they, I'm sorry? Could you repeat the question? There is nobody from... From the local advisory committee, no. Park. There were attendees at the um, community... I understand there might be attendees, but there are no specified members... That's correct. The ...local advisory group, and... Uh, even since you've put this, suggesting this other area in there, you've not gone out to select anybody? No, at that point, the, no, the community, the local advisory committee was already set at that point. That's well, true. obviously we have to change that. And uh, you have possibility to have meetings in, special meeting for those people. I guess we all understand, do you understand that if that boundary is a pretty big wall, the Scarborough versus East York? So if it's happening in Scarborough and you live in East York, you don't necessarily, you're not going. The same, if it's in East York and you're from Scarborough, you're not going. So have you not contemplated special steps now? What I'm going to suggest stakeholders on the local advisory, local meetings, should it go to Scarborough Community Council, that, that the East York side be very much uh, engaged specifically through the planning department. Yes. All those things are possible, but they haven't been contemplated or done yet. The North you... York residents can certainly be added well, to further to the discussion. I'm not yes. sure they're North York residents. They might be at North York Community Council, but that section at O'Connor South is East York. The part I, I see. So it's spanning two, yes. actually, two community councils. Absolutely. From and the old so, days. so it's very confusing already, <laughs> and now we're making it more confusing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do, are you have you been watching us on television? No, I just walked into the building. <laughs> well, welcome to the high seas. <laughs> quickly, quickly, uh, here's the map. Yep. Oh, you're looking at that one. There's the map with all the core employment, and we're discussing if we can move the um, whole secondary plan to Scarborough Community Council. There's a conversation here. Somebody check me if I'm wrong. I'm just asking about the pressure on the core employment areas from this exercise and how that's been taken into account, including, uh, which isn't in the secondary plan, but the Bermondsey employment area, which is full 100% core employment versus the Golden Mile, which is very mixed with big box and other types of employment. So have you been consulted about this at all, or has there been any conversation <clears throat> with that depth? Some of our staff have been involved from our Scarborough office on this plan. 
Uh, I particularly have not had a deep dive on it. You not what? I particular. I personally have not been done a deep dive on it. So. So it's one thing. It's it's. I'm just con wondering what the impact might be when we're thinking that of pressure on both sides. How to build that in? Well, I think they should be. Obviously, we're we're concerned about employment lands everywhere, and whether it's which either side of Victoria Park here, the similar pressures are being faced. Um, it's an important area for job uh, growth and opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions of staff? Seeing none, speakers. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Denzel Lynn Wong. Um, so we're trying to work on something, um, you know, the Councillor Crawford and Thompson and I have been sort of busily drafting away, try, trying to come up with something that's workable. Um, I think we have a functional agreement on the arrangement where um, we, Scarborough Community Council does a, this is sent back to Scarborough Community Council and they have the statutory public meeting and as a compromise, and it, because it is mostly in their area, I recognize that, but that also that the matter also be sent to North York Community Council as an information item where there can be a discussion about it. I think I'm okay with that. Um, uh, um, and I think it's the proper, this is a big deal for Scarborough, it's a big deal for my community. And, and I was trying to think of, some, so for a number of reasons, firstly, it's, it really is a local matter. Secondly, um, not that you aren't, you aren't all nice people, but um, there's no one here from Scarborough Community Council or North York on this committee. And <clears throat> I asked this as a rhetorical, oh, Jay Jay's here. here. Well, Where's not right now. But uh, no one from Scarborough, but I'll, I'll ask you, I'll say this, Where if, if um, <laughs> you know, if they were trying to realign Gerard Street, um, I think that's in Councillor um, uh, Councilor Fletcher's ward, it would be a really big deal. Um, and uh, she'd want to have something to say about it. She don't want to have a lot of community meetings. <clears throat> in, my, in, my, in this arrangement, my resident, I can tell you that I know the people who live in the Bartley area, that's the residential area. I know they don't know about it because if they knew about it, my phone would be ringing off the hook. So take my word for it, they don't know about it and that's a problem. Um, so uh, I'm okay with that. I think we have to have a number of community meetings and tell them what's going on. I think that uh, if they found out what was going on and they, they weren't informed about it, they'd be pretty mad at the local councillor and they'd be pretty mad at City Hall. Um, so uh, I'm not going to move a motion to, to um, have community meetings. I'm just going to kind of start to organize them um, because there, there, have to be, there has to be some and they haven't been, they haven't been informed about this. Um, I don't know if staff have actually crafted a motion for the, is there a motion around? With respect to your discussions with the- Councilor Crawford, yeah. Yes, I believe the clerk has a motion. Oh, okay. Well, I'll look at it and ask someone to, as a courtesy, move it um, if it sort of captures what I'm, what we've been talking. I've been talking to the, the chief planner about that, um, capture what that's been, what what we've been talking about. Um, and my assumption is this probably have to go to uh, council for approval. That's correct. Because we'd have to um, uh, change the procedural bylaw for this item. But I, but I don't I, want to do it that way. Um, anyway, uh, uh, I have that motion. Can I, have you submitted to clerks? So I'll, I believe it's going to be put up for you. Oh, all right. We're trying to. Maybe Councillor Crawford could speak for to save time, but that's all I have to say. Speak right now, and then you'll have yeah. some time to Great. go and uh, look over the motion. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, as, as the Councillor uh, uh, mentioned, this is a big deal for Scarborough. We have been working on this plan for a number of years. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the, um, the extension of, of the LRT and looking at the potential and the possibility of what the Golden Mile will look like in the future. And when you're looking at the size and scope, um, there's probably outside of the, the uh, changes that are taking place in the Scarborough Civic Centre uh, and that whole area, uh, this will be one of the bigger changes in, in Scarborough that'll be taking place, it's really the gateway to Scarborough when you, when you hit Victoria Park. Uh, so the intent all along was to continue, and it, everything had been working its way through Scarborough. 
But as staff were looking at some of the alternatives, I believe it may have been alternative three, realized that a realignment of O'Connor would definitely be or should be part of this or potentially be part of the, the process. What that did is it went just west of uh, Victoria Park, hence the reason why we are here, even though Council did move a motion last year. Um, and and Councillor Thompson and I have been working closely with uh, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Minin Wong on trying to, and uh, he's also the Deputy Mayor, uh, two Deputy Mayors and a Budget Chief to figure out how we can move forward. Really what we're, what we're looking to do is, is we wanted to have the statutory meeting to ha be in Scarborough, uh, where the vast majority of this plan actually is and, and most of, if not all of the uh, community consultations have been. So we want to try to figure out a, a way to do that. I recognize that not only if we get support here at this committee, it still needs to go to full council. We still will need two thirds. Uh, I, we recognize that. Uh, but we, what we're asking this committee is to be able to forward it to council uh, with the, oh, there's the amendment up there that I believe Council, or, uh, Chair Bilal was, was going to move. Uh, but it's really just the opportunity for the statutory meeting to go to Scarborough. Uh, we've been working with both planning staffs in Scarborough and downtown and I think there's a general agreement that we can make it work. Uh, and that's the request uh, if through that motion is to, to have this. As I said, understanding that we will have to uh, have the two-thirds of council, but if we could just move this uh, through this committee, uh, I'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Fletcher. I do have a couple of motions, and not that uh, I just want to make sure that somebody from the new side is going to be on the uh, local advisory or stakeholders, so that Councillor Deputy Mayor can get some people over there so they're part of planning that road. And also I believe that uh, now that I do represent East York and the old Toronto, that you have to be very careful with these boundaries. So, and people in East York don't think of themselves as Toronto people the same and people in Scarborough don't think of themselves as East York and North York people. It's just the way it is. Those are pretty big and Victoria Park is probably the biggest wall ever. It's kind of like the Great Wall of China because it's never changed after amalgamation. It's still intact. So people just don't think if they're on the other side that what goes over there has anything to do with them. And I really appreciate what the Deputy Mayor has said that nobody knows. So there's a catch up here that I think planning staff have to undertake rather rapidly by inserting people in the process and by having whatever special meeting that would be called with the deputy to make sure people are up to speed on what's gonna happen on O'Connor. Because one day when you find that the road's closed and it's gonna be new, you're gonna be a little surprised. And that is why we do things in larger committee um, You've heard about my concern on the uh, employment, impact on employment. So this will have to come back here at some point and I'd like to have that in as a consideration because I know as soon as those meetings are being held, people will say, well, look, this is great. We can have residential all the way down. We can have residential everywhere in order to serve transit. And I know that because I've been dealing with that on the uh, first Gulf site for five years, it shouldn't be jobs. It should be mixed use, which in their mind means residential with a few corner stores. That's what the community tends to think of as mixed use. So I think that that for me, there's a big flag there. That's why I wanted to ask Mr. Williams here. And I hope that you don't mind Deputy Merritt that I've just inserted a few things here that would structurally require this process to involve you and your constituents west of Victoria Park. And I've named East York and North York. And thank you, I'm moving your motion. No problem, happy to do that. Yes, happy to do that to reflect those. So I move both of those. In particular, the road grid is the one that, um, uh, the road grid is the one that I hear people really need to understand what's happening and not feel like this has gone down so far before they're included. So I'm sure that we can get to that rather quickly. Okay, yep. thank you. Any other speakers on the item? Seeing none, I'll move uh, the motion on behalf of uh, Deputy Mayor Denzelman Wong and Councillor Crawford and Councillor Thompson. And 
I think we can go for a, a vote. Shall we? So if I could have Councillor Fletcher's motions. Yep. They're coming. Oh, well, that's first? Okay. Okay, all those in favor? That carries. Next motion from Councillor Fletcher, all those in favor? And that carries. And the last motion, all those in favor, that carries. Item as amended, all those in favor, and that carries. Great, thank you. Next item. Oh, sorry. Uh, next item, John Mills Crossing final report. We have speakers, if I could have Bruce Hall coming to the team. Everything's happening in your ward, Denzel. Good morning. You have five minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Bruce Hall, and I have with me my friend Chris Tanzola, and we are both here on behalf of the Independent Order of Foresters, or we'll just call them Foresters. And um, we're here in response to the um, proposal for the uh, Don Mills Secondary, Don Mills Crossing Secondary Plan. Um, Foresters is the owner of a large site at the corner of Don Mills and Roquefort Drive, and the address is 789 Don Mills Road. And that is a large site which runs uh, east all the way from that intersection to Ferran Drive. It's about two hectares in size. And their property is comprised of three main elements. Their 23-story um, office tower, which is a name building. It's hard not to miss. Um, and a detached uh, podium. There's a four-leveled structured parking garage in behind. Um, which is accessed by Forester's Lane and a large surface parking lot which runs all the way over to Ferran Drive. Okay. As a property owner and a major tenant in the building, Forester's has remained very active um, and kept abreast of a number of recent planning initiatives including the Don Mills Crossing Secondary Plan which affect this site and the area and um, the other initiatives, larger employment areas in general. The impetus for doing this for foresters is several fold. It is the headquarters of their operation. It's an active office building, and they want to ensure the viability and functionality of that going forward, as well as the ability to undertake an upgrade or enhance that function. They are a significant stakeholder within the secondary plan area, um, specifically the southeast quadrant of Eglinton and Don Mills Road. Their lands represent about 36% of that area, and they are the major employment focus in that area with several thousand jobs in that building. At the same time, their overall site represents opportunities for significant redevelopment and intensification in accordance with the secondary plan. Um, this is a very well located site from transportation perspective, the new Eglinton Crosstown, Don Mills and the Don Valley Parkway. It's somewhat underutilized in its current form because it has these large um, areas in behind and there are opportunities to um, enhance it in the future to become more transit supportive and contribute to the completeness of this emerging community. The rear portions of this site do represent opportunities to intensify through the structured parking and the vacant parking lots and this would help enhance the overall community in terms of the streetscape and the public realm and the general character. In terms of the, and it's possible to do this while maintaining the employment function. In terms of the Don Mills secondary plan, it's establishing a comprehensive framework which supports this concept. We commend staff and the, and the stakeholders on the planning process and the product that achieves uh, this and the time and energy that's gone into it. We've been actively involved throughout the process, been to several meetings and open houses. We've reviewed all the documents report. We've met with staff on several occasions and reviewed their recommendation analysis and had a lot of collaboration with them. S staff was available and open to discussion and consideration and made accommodations in response, in response to our concerns. 
And when I say concerns, ours were largely matters of clarification related to issues of height and density and flexibility. We were also concerned that a large part of the density that was being allocated um, would be used up um, on other sites um, and uh, by the existing residential and office, the Sonic condos which are under development and the Create TO site under development. We also were concerned that other sites would inequitably use up density um, that could properly be used uh, with the redevelopment opportunities on Foresters in the future. Staff mitigated these concerns by separating out the Create TO site um, uh, uh, which allowed us to, you know, um, uh, properly calculate the density uh, on the future site in a fair and equitable manner um, and recognize the structured parking and surface parking opportunities. Um, they also acknowledge um, the large areas being a context plan area which um, requires as a part of a complete application in the future to demonstrate conformity with the secondary plan and comprehensively address all matters of site building and urban design. Um, overall, we appreciate staff's willingness to work with us in a collaborative manner to resolve our concerns in a fair and equitable way. Um, with the exception of some remarks my friend here will make, we really support wholeheartedly the adoption of this secondary plan. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Christopher? Sure, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, questions of the deputant. It, it may make sense for me. I'm going to just follow the theme, and it may make sense to ask questions to both of us, but it's obviously your committee and not mine. Okay, go ahead, Chris. Um, thank you very much. My name is Chris Tanzola. I'm the lawyer for Foresters, and I've been involved with their site um, for a few years now as various planning initiatives have come forward. And um, one of the, uh, the mandates that I've had is to just, uh, in consideration that Foresters is a, a large employer and landowner in that quadrant, just to make sure we're paying uh, attention to the planning processes and making sure that uh, the, the public planning that's being done is not, um, is not unduly hindering the future potential redevelopment of this site, given that the opportunities that do exist, which, uh, as, as Mr. Hall has said, have been recognized by staff in the secondary plan, and we, we very much appreciate the willingness of staff to work with us in clarifying the way some of the density allocations were made and the way the context plan uh, feature of the secondary plan functions. And, um, and so I wanted to, to pick up on that and thank staff for that. Uh, what that allows foresters to do is to uh, have flexibility for the future. They have, they have occupied this site since they built the building in the 1960s. Uh, they, have, uh, they are the main tenant there. They have 800 employees of their 2,000 total employees in that building. They have 35 tenants that they are the landlord for. And uh, as an as a owner and a landlord, uh, we just want to make sure that there's flexibility for this site as we move forward. And we think that the secondary plan in terms of the, the built form principles uh, is, is doing a good job on that and we are supportive and, and thank staff for that. Um, we do have a concern that we, we put into the, the correspondence that's on file with um, a, a piece of the secondary plan um, but also uh, the heritage assessment report that came forward. And what we're asking is just to make sure that the dialogue, the productive open dialogue that we've had with staff on the built form principles and the density principles that that would continue for any, any future heritage consideration for this property to make sure that uh, anything that's being done with respect to heritage would, uh, would involve us in a direct discussion to make sure that we can continue to operate that site uh, as a modern office building and, uh, and make sure that the development potential for that site is, uh, is, is realized in the future. Right now, Foresters does not have any active development applications, um, but there is obviously development potential given the, the, surface, parking, uh, the surface parking lot and the, the raised parking structure. So again, thank you to staff and thank you to the committee for, uh, for paying attention to our deputation. Thank you. Questions of the deputant? So um, Foresters is on the list for, is, is your interpretation of the Foresters building being mentioned here as it relates to heritage, that there's no designation contemplated, just further investigation? That, my, that's my understanding of, the, of the, the way that that consultant's report is being brought forward. That, um, that there's no recommendation being made today with respect to heritage, that that would be a future process that heritage staff might undergo. But we've read that report and we, we, we understand that um, there are a lot of heritage considerations that could be brought to bear on the property. Right. And that's, we just wanna make sure that we're an active part of that discussion. You've never thought of yourself as a heritage building, have you? Uh, we certainly haven't thought that way in the past, although um, we recognize it's kind of uh, a skyline type of building. 
um, because you see it from the DVP quite clearly, and uh, right. it, it, is, it is kind of a hard building to miss. Uh, but we just would want to make sure that there's an active discussion with us if there, if there is a thought to, to take a heritage. Also, your, your so the secondary plan contemplates your property being zoned for what? So the, right now, that's a mixed-use designation for it's the property under, under the current, under the current plan, and it continues to be what's called mixed-use A, I think, in the plan, which is the core area of the plan. Yeah, because uh, you're the only real, well, we're, we're all be surrounded, you're going to be surrounded by residential, yes? That's right. There were, there were three or four office buildings in the quadrant up until maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, yeah, yeah. one of which was converted to... Money building. Um, pardon me, sir? The Money Building. That, that was, was the one that was north that they blew up. They converted. Yeah. One was converted to a condominium, and then one was uh, was taken down and replaced with two condo towers. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, next deputant, Ken Rippon, Community Share Food Bank. Good morning, Ken. Go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Ken Rippon. I am a member of the Board of Directors and a volunteer of the Community Share Food Bank in Don Mills, North York. We are located within the boundaries of the community service area of influence of the proposed Don Mills Crossing Secondary Plan. Community Share has been working with marginalized communities since 2004. We are a volunteer run serving approximately 150 families per week and a member agency of North York Harvest and Second Harvest. Over the past 14 years, we have seen a major recession, the Syrian refugee crisis, new immigrants such as doctors, dentists, veterinarians struggling to find entry level work, anywhere, let alone in their chosen profession. Isolated seniors, single parent families, the list goes on. While Community Share serves a, a diverse clientele, they all share socioeconomic challenges such as barriers of accessing affordable housing, decent work, and limited social services that have led to poverty and food insecurity. Although we are located in what may be perceived as an affluent neighborhood, it does not mean need isn't there. In some cases, access to services is even worse. Many of our participants have fallen through the cracks of the system, which means that we are already serving some of the most vulnerable and hard to reach individuals and families. We know poverty can be isolating. We also know that food has the power to bring people together, which is why we have been working in partnership with other agencies and health centers to offer cooking workshops and community kitchens on a regular basis. This past year, we have started a healthy snack program during food bank hours, and we are seeing firsthand how food is a great connector. In addition, we are dedicated to providing healthier food, hampers, and are currently developing a healthy food policy that will include ongoing practical education and support. Two years ago, the church in which we occupy space suffered financial setbacks and had to increase our rent substantially. We have been looking for affordable space since, but commercial properties are outside of our budget and other possibilities appear to be non-existent. What we have discovered is a lack of community services and support in our area. We were hopeful about the community space promised by the Cadillac Fairview project. However, new plans have allocated resources to the Don Mills Crossing area instead, and that is why we are here. As the Don Mills Crossing area begins to redevelop, we believe this is an important opportunity to secure community benefits such as community kitchens, a meeting space to be able to continue the work we do at Community Share. This may be our best opportunity to join forces, for, join forces with other service providers 
or resident-led programs to improve health and well-being and foster greater sense of community. Examples include nutrition education, cooking classes, meal programs, where our food bank can act as an entry point to other services, and a very meaningful way to address the complex issue of hunger. We are very pleased to see that pages 33 and 47 of the recommended secondary plan prioritize the creation of a multi-purpose, non-profit community agency space. We are asking that the committee to ensure such a space would include a community kitchen accessible to residents and volunteer-run programs like Community Share Food Bank so that we can continue building on the momentum and the important strides that we have made to date. Community Share Food Bank volunteers and board members have always believed that our food bank does not give handouts, but we offer instead hand-ups. This is what we do 52 weeks a year, every Tuesday and every Saturday. From April 1, 2018 to March 31, 2019, we offered hand-ups to 415 different families. This translated into 6,520 hampers. The 6,520 hampers mean 21,712 people were served with dignity and respect. In some small way, I hopefully, to to we can up, open sir. the doors so that we can also share sir. the Canadian dream. Thank you. I'm going to have to Thank ask you, you to wrap up. Thank you for your opportunity to speak to Thank you today. You. Thank you. Question. Questions of staff? Councillor Robinson? No, of the... Um, uh, never mind. That's okay. <laughs> yes. I, know, I know what you mean. Okay. <laughs> Um, my apologies, I have a, a very uh, bad cold, but thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, very much, Ken. And uh, I know you know Diane well. I do, and I know a lot of your contributors and volunteers, and I have to just acknowledge the work that you do in Don Mills and beyond. Uh, it's very impressive, and I know it's fully volunteer run, so thank you for that. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to get at exactly what you're looking for today, so I think you can help me. The question is, you, you mentioned a multi-purpose multi community facility uh, hub, and you would like you would like your organization, Community Share, to be part of that. I don't know all the details of your plan. I have thumbed through the pages, but 33 and 47 sort of talk to the issues of creating space, uh, right? That would be appropriate for communities. I mean, we, as I said, the board thought. The Church of the Ascension, where we are, is in deep financial trouble. I know that, yes. And it, and, and it, is, it is not going to last. Right. All right? And we have been desperately trying to find commercial space, and it's way out of our budget. Yes. We have $90,000 in a budget, and we spend 30-some-odd thousand dollars just in rent. And even that won't buy us proper space. So we need to find, as I said, we're not looking for a handout. We're looking for a hands up. We need someone to help us. And if you have this space that you are rethinking at Don Mills in Eglinton, and I'm not an expert on it, but now is the time to think in the 21st century. Yes. Okay. Food banks were an issue that thought would go away, but we also thought income tax was going to go away. It's not happening. Okay? Okay. So basically, what you're asking committee today. Uh, because of the Cadillac Fairview scenario where that community centre has now, in my understanding, is being moved, sh shifted south to Slastica, what you're asking is for the committee to consider reviewing an opportunity to incorporate uh, community share food bank into the new community space in the northwest quadrant of that intersection, Daw Mills. You have a brand new, I don't know how many acre space that you're going to redevelop. And I think you should think seriously about some kind of community hub centre that we could be part of. We're not asking to be there for free. Uh, Diane and I have sat and had a lovely meeting with Denzel, and he's, he's very aware of our, our situation. But if you're going to create space, we, we could take that space, we could rent that space, and we could provide a great service to the community because our food bank does other things. We're just not a food bank. 
And yeah, and there's a, there's that, a, there's that a, you're creative on a people deadline. and creative minds and, and the proper use of money, we, we could, it could be a real asset. So you're on a deadline, really. I mean, that's well, a, a foreseeable. The Church of Ascension is asking for a $240,000 donation to put a new roof on a building that they're going to tear down. Does right. that make any sense to you? Yeah. No. no. Okay. And then um, would you, are you, you talked about in the, your earlier part of your deputation about cooking facilities and... Besides, yeah, that's right. Besides handing out food hampers, we have found to treat people with dignity and respect that we have a healthy food project. We feed people with a proper breakfast when they arrive in the day. We have a group of dedicated uh, staff that, uh, and we are now going to incorporate that to healthy meals so that if they don't eat the whole meal, they can take it with them. So we've just expanded the program from just loading boxes and taking things out and you know so and the people there have a smile on their face it's a it's a social atmosphere for them they connect they they, they answer they get information about income tax or dentistry or immigration we solve a lot of their problems okay. thank you thank you so much any other f questions of the deputant seeing none thank you so much thank anyone you so else much. that would like to uh, speak on this item thank you Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Jeff Cattell. I'm today we're in the hat of uh, Cycle Don Valley Midtown, which is the uh, Cycle Toronto branch from <laughs> Ward 15, Ward 16, um, under the new setup. Uh, so basically, I'm talking about um, improving opportunities for active transportation, and in general, the, the plan does a good job. Um, the plan identifies um, some of the you know, issues being in a suburban part of the city. There definitely are issues for active transportation under the present, at the present time. It's, it talks about the study area exhibiting poor connectivity in pedestrian and cycling networks, which is attributed to the lack of local streets and the presence of cul-de-sacs, discontinuous sidewalks, and, sidewalk, and cycling facilities with physical barriers like the, the valley, the ravine, um, and uh, recreational trails located along the Don. However, there are few, lo few locations where trails are not continuous. Safety is another concern, especially uh, crossing the major intersections at, at uh, Don Mills Road and Eglinton Avenue. So the, the what does the plan do about this? The plan addresses this, but only in part. It proposes to connect the Don Mills Trail from the north with the Don Mills Trail from the south via a new crossover or under of the CP rail line on the west side of the, of the Celestica site and utilization of the cloverleaf connections under Eglinton Avenue. When implemented, this would enable a continuous north-south corridor for both commuter and recreational cyclists between North York, York Mills Road, and the Lakeshore. Fantastic. However, um, what I'm proposing today is that there needs to be a safe cycling alternative to Don Mills Road on the north and east side of the plan area. A proposal has been submitted to this committee by um, a resident, Ron Kluger, and the letter's in the, in the file, for a bike pedestrian connection across or under the CP rail line on the north side for residents on the west and the east side of Don Mills Road. This proposal would extend Prince Andrew Place, which is currently a cul-de-sac, which ends near the rail line, with the Celestica project, thereby leading to the Don, Mill, Don River Trail with a bike pedestrian connection over or under the CP rail track. So we um, certainly support the secondary plan as far as it goes, but believe it does not, not go far enough to connect the study area with the areas around it. We believe that the plan should resist treating the CP rail corridor as an impenetrable barrier. Instead, it should do its utmost to create porosity and increase opportunities for safe mobility for the residents of the project and its neighbors. So we, we um, request that um, the following, um, that Planning and Housing Committee recommend to Council that the Prince Andrew Place extension to the Celestica project, multi-purpose and rail crossover, be incorporated into the Don Mills secondary plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today, Jeff. Uh, 
Questions of staff? Uh, Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask about the, the, my beloved Don Mills Trail that I worked on for eight years and really we never were able to break out the south end of it due to landlocked issues. Clearly we have a resolution here which uh, is such a great news story. Um, I guess what's, uh, what's the timelines because literally we've waited, a, a trail was built without a completion, without a connection way before I was elected. And um, that in itself is uh, kind of um, awkward and the communities love the trail but it does create safety issues at the south end of the trail. So my question is, what are the timelines for completing this trail so it connects both pedestrians and cyclists to the rest of the city, literally just south of there and over to Sunnybrook Park? Uh, what is the game plan and what are the timelines? Because we've just waited forever for this. Um, through the chair, the, there's sort of two pl places where the trail can be resolved. One is over to Leslie, and the timeline for that is tied to development approval for in on the park. Um, it was secured through, um, or Section 37 agreement is being drafted to secure the resolution of the trail to come out to Leslie to be constructed down into the park. The second place the trail could resolve itself is to cross the rail corridor through the uh, Domino's Crossing secondary plan area into the ravine. That's arguably a longer term timeline because it requires the development approval for the Winford Green application to unfurl and an environmental assessment process for the design across the rail corridor and down into the valley. So the shorter term resolution would be across to Leslie. Right. That may hit some hiccups, as you know, Councillor, uh, through the uh, potential for a uh, need for an expropriation and or the demolition of a parking structure that kind of gets in the way. So. Hopefully, again, that unfurls to the development approval of the end on the park site. Okay, so really what you're saying is there isn't, we don't have a, it's not a big ribbon cutting date. I, I wouldn't want to place one on the calendar. No, not even close to that. I would rely on others uh, from potentially transportation services to answer that question, but um, I wouldn't want to place a hold in my calendar. Okay, and then what about the option of going into the Celestica property and, and what, would the, what would the infrastructure look like to make that leap over the, the, rail, the railway lands? So th through you, Madam Chair, we, as part of the Celestica approval process, we did secure uh, 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 Section 37 funds for, uh, for, a rail, for a rail crossing. It is part of the approval. Uh, as my colleague mentioned, there is a there's an environmental assessment that needs to be done to confirm whether that would be a connection over or under the railway tracks. But that that but that pros, but that money and uh, design has been plan has been secured. Okay, and uh, this is a different question um, related to uh, the what the deputation we heard from Ken. Uh, it, he talked about this multi-purpose not profit not for profit community space. How is that different from the, what was to be the Cadillac Fairview Community Center that's shifting south? I believe it's shifting south. Maybe someone can give me a head shake. I it is. Uh, how does that differ, how does that differ, those two entities? He talked about a multi-purpose, not, not, not for profit community space. How does that right. differ from the community space that was being proposed on the Cadillac Fairview site? Brenda so, Patterson knows this file best, but she retired, unfortunately. Okay. That was your uh, Not having Brenda's phone number, I'll, I'll do my best to answer through the chair. Uh, the, the discussions about um, consolidation of community centers is being undertaken right now through PFNR. Um, the difference between a community center writ large and community agency space as identified specifically in the secondary plan is that the agency space could be secured um, within a development uh, and it need not be within a large community facility. So um, in other development sites throughout the city, sometimes we're able to secure a long-term lease um, through with a developer for agency space that's flexible, that could have a community kitchen, have employment services, et cetera. We would secure a 99-year lease. It would be administered, I believe, through SDFA. So for example, if a mixed-use development were to come in with a non-residential component, agency space could be secured as part of the Section 37 agreement to accommodate um, community kitchen or, or any other non-for-profit. Does it have to be an agency? Sorry. 
Does it have to be an agency or just a community operation? It could be as long as it's a not-for-profit, but it would okay. be termed okay. and secured through Thank an you, approval. Thank you, Madam Chair, for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, speakers, Deputy Mayor Desmond Lee Wong. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to have to leave shortly because I have the Civic Appointments Committee to chair. Um, I'm generally okay with this. I, I um, did have a chance to briefly look through the um, properties that, they, that are for study for heritage, de heritage, heritage designation. It's a long list. I have some significant concerns with that, especially as it relates to um, some properties that are, let's say, underutilized, like TCH properties that, uh, that I think uh, could be redeveloped and for a, a better public good. Um, and some of these properties, I kind of question whether, um, whether we should be moving forward with that designation. My preference would be to remove it from this, this, this particular study um, and move forward with the, with the rest of the secondary plan. Um, with regard to, the only other comment that I'll make is I have some, a lot of visibility into what's being contemplated with um, a new community center for Don Mills. Um, and the issue of a community kitchen for the entire community has been raised, and hopefully there, there will be sufficient resources there to include that. It is not just the Don Mills community that's interested in a com community kitchen. The Fleming and Park community has raised this on a number of occasions, so we're, we're hopeful. We're not for sure. It's not for sure. It has to come to executive committee, but we're hopeful that, and, and I, I would like to see a community ki kitchen included in that site. So I, for Councillor Robinson and for the deputy who, I don't know if he's still here or not, um, maybe that gives him some hope for the future. Anyway, um, thank you very much for indulging me. I'm gonna head off to civic appointments. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I have a couple um, motions, but um, just really to prioritize the Don Mills Trail. So they're quickly, um, we sent that to them, but they didn't see the email. So if, oh, that's right now. Okay, so this is the first one. And this simply is something I've moved at council before. I think actually just before we broke for the election, um, the importance of this trail is critical to the neighborhoods in the Don Mills area. Um, both uh, Councillor Denzel and Wong's area and mine. So this is just another request to get this prioritized and accelerated, this extension. It's actually a major safety issue for residents, for women, for seniors, uh, for people in, 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 with mobility challenges. Uh, it just dead ends. And you're kind of in this kind of bizarre um, area that's a bit industrial or employment lands. And it's just gone on way too long. I'm not sure why the trail was built without an end, but uh, people have enjoyed it until they get to the end. And then they cut through the fence with um, wire cutters um, and try to escape through commercial lands. So we have to address this um, be, just on the mere fact it's a safety issue. And um, so I'm just simply saying prioritize, accelerate it. Uh, it's actually not my ward anymore. It was my ward for eight years. And with the re-division of the, um, uh, the new boundaries for the wards, it's just literally uh, meters east of my current ward, Ward 15. But I want to continue to see this through because I did work on it with many staff for, for eight years. Uh, I have two other motions. Um, which Jeff Cattell alluded to um, in his presentation on this cycling request. So, oh, no, it wasn't this one, it was the cycling one. I can jump to this one, if, do, you, do you have the cycling one? Okay, I'll jump to this one and come back to the cycling one. Okay, so this one, um, unfortunately Ken's left, but I can't tell you how important community share is to the City of Toronto. I mean, they, their distribution is massive, their catchment area is huge, and they are struggling and have been struggling for years in the basement of a church that's struggling. So we must work with this dynamic group of people 
to help them find a new facility. And I didn't run this by Denzel, but again, um, the original community centre was supposed to be on the Cadillac Fairview site. My understanding is they're looking at reviewing, shifting it to Celestica. I'm not sure I entirely agree with that, but it's not my ward anymore. But if, if that does happen, I hope that it'll be incorporated into the, the new community centre or uh, in my motion, I've actually cited what was in the in the um, report, and that's this multi-purpose non-profit community space. This organization is um, so well organized, and what they're doing in the community is beyond. Uh, I don't think uh, any other organization is as uh, effective as as they are in doing their work. But they do it quietly behind the scenes. They rarely put a hand out for help. But today they're saying we need we need a landing pad in the next few years. So I hope that staff will review this op or you know you can change the wording if you want if staff want to change the wording but review this opportunity to incorporate this amazing organization into the this what will be the new uh, Celestica's property that new site. Uh, my third motion is the Jeff Cattell motion. The man with many hats. <laughs> I don't know how many hats. <clears throat> Every time he signs off an email to me it's got a different title different community organization, but here it comes, and uh, he read it out in his deputation, so I hope you heard it, and it's just looking to connect uh, the bike trails. I guess they're having a hard time finding it, or getting it up. Okay, you done, Councillor? I am, Benson? thank Great. you. Great, any other speakers? Seeing none, uh, are we ready? No. I'm going to have to stand down this item just because staff is just working on emo the motions. So, um, but maybe I'll just add a minute of remarks. There you go. <laughs> go ahead. Let's see if I can help you out a little bit. That's for wrong, Tim. I want to thank staff for, for this report so far. Um, and I've been very quiet on, on the file, but I do know that this is a, an extraordinary amount of work by, by all account. Um, I also want to uh, note that um, the heritage uh, uh, resource, the cultural heritage resource assessment concluded by staff was also a very important piece of this, uh, of this document. It hasn't really been spoken to as of yet. Um, and I know that there are times where we identify uh, heritage, potential heritage assets, but there isn't, um, there is supposed to be follow-up work. And I, and I do know that sometimes the, the threat to heritage properties sometimes looms much larger and much bigger uh, than the other assets that make up the, the urban built form environment. Um, so my encouragement to staff is to, and I see uh, Tamara uh, Carson Wright who's here, uh, my encouragement to you is to take that piece and, and run with it as quickly as possible and, uh, and try to get in front of the wrecking uh, ball and the bulldozers that are most likely to come. Um, and knowing that um, there's now this level of attention um, and excitement coming to the area, uh, it will uh, be coming. And so those assets will be under threat. Um, and I know that it's critically important to make sure that those 19 properties that you've identified with the community support um, has the level of attention that it, 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 uh, it needs in order for you to preserve it. And if that means that you have to take the instructions, the recommendations from this report and, and move that forward and speed it up, um, I'm going to encourage you to do so. And I'm going to say that without uh, moving any recommendations or amendments. Thank you. Ready? Okay. In that one, can just stop. So. Okay. So I think, I think we're good to go. Um, I would like to move a couple of motions. One of them I'm actually moving on behalf of staff and uh, this is uh, work that staff have been doing with CreateTO and is to, uh, with related to the Housing Now sites that are, are part of this, um, uh, this area study and is just to ensure that, you know, uh, both departments are speaking the same language and we're going to be able to attain our goals. Um, and the second motion, it's, it's actually um, asking for a bit more of review on the uh, heritage. So I'm asking the, the heritage portion to be uh, sent back. Uh, the concern is actually around the properties around Flemington Park. Um, and uh, I think that a, a little bit more thought needs to be put into this uh, and how we measure uh, this with uh, all the social impacts and social benefits. And, and um, 
you know, what what are we preserving in there? I think that that needs to be a broader discussion in there, and and I'm hoping that staff can work with that with all of us and reflect a little bit more on that, uh, and uh, and report back. I think there's a lot of buildings that absolutely need to be preserved. Uh, we're not we don't do a very good job of preserving a modern architecture, and I think this is an opportunity in this area to do that. But I think that there's certain things in here that need to, uh, that need uh, um, a bit more. Uh, uh, broader look and and consideration so I hope that uh, I can get go ahead um, so counselor I'm just curious to know because the motion motion number five specifically um, requests a like city council at the very upcoming meeting endorse the uh, the cultural heritage resource assessment um, that is part of the overall planning report the document um, there was a broad consultation uh, as you know uh, heritage uh, uh, heritage potential heritage assets don't necessarily just get randomly listed they go through a, a study and a review um, what is it that troubles you about that recommendation that you need staff to to do the further review on that the endorsement of Flemington Park I have questions about that how that uh, is so much different from Regent Park and Alexander Park and all the other townhouses. Uh, how is that gonna actually impact? I don't understand the impacts that it will have uh, if TCHC was to redevelop this this uh, this site. Uh, the social impacts actually, you know, they, these are big communities, have no connection. There's social issues around these communities. And so have those been taken consideration? I do think that these are conversations that need to happen uh, before we send it to council and ask for their endorsement. I think we as a community committee should have a further reflection on those things. And when do you hope this, uh, this conversation? You know, this happened really fast and I didn't want to put a date. I mean, as soon as staff can come back, I just <coughs> didn't want to impose a date on that. I mean, I'm sure that they'll do the work as, as fast as they can they know that the urgency given the all the other buildings that as I said very much need to be endorsed by council can we put a date on that councillor just because I know that uh, without a date it just means that it may not come back in a timely fashion um, how much time do you can, believe is required can I consult with staff uh, I would like to f to uh, yes and can I also perhaps move of ask for a friendly amendment to also include uh, the preservation yes. in 2019 is that okay oh, definitely yeah 2019 is, is a great year um, okay but I would also ask that it, it it's done in consultation with the preservation uh, staff as well yes the heritage preservation absolutely. staff absolutely I think that's got to it yep. has to go together and if you can consider that a friendly amendment absolutely okay are we ready to vote Good. If, if, um, um, Madam Chair, if they could just show my motion, it actually never went up on the screen, so I want to make sure the, not, yes, this one, is that it? No, not that one. The one, the cycling one never went on the screen. Yeah, no, that's not it. It's the third one. Okay, bam, that is it. So just so the committee sees that. And it's basically, I, I don't need to go into any detail because Jeff Cattell did a great job. <coughs> Okay, just a few seconds and staff will get ready to vote. We can go, ready, okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Let's start getting the motion number one. All those in favor? Number two, all those in favor, that carries. And number three, all those in favor, that carries. Motion four, all those in favor, we oppose, that carries. 
And last one, motion five. All those in favor, any oppose? And that carries. Item is amended. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Uh, item 4.2, actually. So, uh, Toronto Heritage Grant Awards. I think we just need a motion to. Councillor uh, Perks, all those in favor? And that uh, against, seeing none, that carries. Item 4.4. Uh, official plan review, draft transportation policies and consultations. And we have speakers, Raymond Chen. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, good morning. I ask this committee to one, instruct staff to provide evaluations of the merits of the 30 projects on map four of the official plan. And two, instruct staff to propose a comprehensive long-term master transit plan. Our current transit problems, overcrowding, Young Bloor, better need for transit to Liberty Village, Humber Bay, and Scarborough are due to failures of past city councils to plan for projects. This committee must recognize the importance of good public transit. Good public transit provides mobility in less fortunate neighborhoods to jobs outside their zone, fostering economic well-being and allowing residents to bring home culturally sensitive or more nutritious food found outside their immediate neighborhood. The city must stop approving funding first, then finding out later the project doesn't work. It should spend time to develop a core strategy. This avoids the short-term scrambles that are so apparent in yesterday's report, Transit, Ex Transit Expansion Program Update and Next Steps. The emergency add-on projects included the Exhibition Loop, Dufferin Loop Streetcar Connection, and Bloor Young Capacity Improvement, two projects I've never heard of and are not included in Map 4 of the official plan. On February 17, 2019, 22 councillors received an email with the subject line, Official Plan. It included four suggestions to be added to Map 4 and predicted the March 26 subway upload outcome. So to the top left, City Council. In the top right, an early draft of Map 4 of the Official Plan in the center is one person's take of map four. To the bottom right, you don't see it, is the rejected map four. The placard reads, Ford's transit plan coming soon. The city had six weeks to plan for the March 26th memo. This committee and city council must not ignore the importance of map four. The city doesn't have a compelling transit plan worth fighting the provincial government over. Map four has 30 projects. Does the city have $100 billion to pay for them? This is why I ask this committee to, one, instruct staff to provide evaluations of the merits of the 30 projects on map four of the official plan and two, instruct staff to propose a comprehensive long-term master transit plan. You will be long out of office while the official plan lives on. I still have some time left. So this is map four per the official plan that's attachment eight. I'm suggesting three additional projects uh, to map four as, as plans. And uh, that's about it. Does anyone have any questions of our deputant today? Thank you very much for coming down. Uh, next deputant, Hamish Wilson. <laughs> well, thank you, Gord. Good morning. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thanks for hauling in. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so I'm a bit late to all of this uh, in some ways. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of work done already and uh, thank you and yet also some inadequacies. Uh, and certainly we're all finding out just what is the point of planning these days. It must be incredibly frustrating for all of, all of you. Uh, we think we've got something happening and then our great premier fact, the Doug Tater uh, comes in, rips them all up and on we go and what happens. So with that point in mind, considering that we're actually uh, not sure uh, what's happening with the Scarborough subway and how ludicrously expensive, it's not good value. So I really think uh, item four, uh, on recommendation four, uh, Planning and Housing Committee requests the Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning to submit a final recommendation report uh, to, uh, on, on the transportation of the Scarborough Centre secondary plan. Don't have the meeting. Start the withdrawal from this very costly Scarborough subway extension. Uh, do not have this process. Start backing away from the Scarborough subway right here, right now. Um, we just found out over the weekend that there's another at least uh, 400 million, uh, yeah, 400 million dollars that wasn't actually uh, brought forward at the time, it seems, and we need to squeeze those billions. Uh, and with respect to the people in Scarborough, they need better transit. Uh, we have to spend money out there. But uh, there's this wonderful report from the TTC uh, making headway, capital investments to keep transit moving. There's an awful lot of cost there that's not uh, uh, taken care of. And in terms of your official plan, this, this particular thing, there's talk about keeping things in good repair. Uh, this is a, a good old cartoon that if we applied it to the roads, uh, we might actually, our, our roads are getting in really, really rough shape. So are we sacrificing our road systems to help uh, uh, get a, a really costly uh, uh, extension in Scarborough? Um, and yes, so uh, are we including any climate uh, issues in this uh, official plan? I think we should. Uh, mm, transport leads are greenhouse gas emissions. Here's an example of just how <laughs> We don't seem to have ambition anymore. <laughs> Isn't, wouldn't that be an interesting uh, concept? But in order to get to that, we have to have much better, much better transit. Um, and so that gets to uh, uh, the uh, 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 map four that uh, the previous uh, Raymond uh, got to as well. There's an, there are some things that aren't in there that should be, I think. Specifically, very specifically for Scarborough, uh, there's the Gatineau Hydro Corridor that I think is really an incredible potential for a lot of people, a lot of good, a lot of emissions reductions, 401 relief, having uh, GO Transit use it as a busway, putting in a subway, if we have to have a subway, do it on, gr on grade. It connects to a lot of uh, places in Scarborough. Uh, surface is way cheaper. I also see that we could actually connect up to uh, Thorncliffe and to the core uh, as well for surface relief. I was interested in uh, map four as well to see something about using the Don Valley's, uh, the, the spur line that's owned by Metrolinx um, beside the Don Valley to get uh, further north. This was in a previous official plan uh, to use the Don Valley for surface relief to get up to Eglinton. Uh, that didn't happen. It's a shame that it didn't. I think we need to be sur focusing on surface relief as a means of, of actually getting things uh, done up to Bluer and beyond. This is from the 40s. Uh, with other transit things, uh, I, I feel that we, we are on map four, we are using Queen Street again. I don't think that's appropriate. I think we need King Street as the TDC actually suggested. Uh, a few years back, so I'm not happy with the relief uh, line uh, uh, allocations. I think we should do the broad corridor of King Queen. Uh, with biking, I'm sorry, to, and there's lots more to go on about. Oh yes, with biking, here we are. Uh, if we had surface relief uh, with a bikeway in London, they estimated uh, relief uh, with a good bikeway uh, as much as 10%. We need to have the, uh, the, the built-in uh, bikeway relief of transit. We have so many gaps. Uh, do we have a listing of those gaps? I'm sorry to see that we're having the, uh, the bike plan, uh, the old 2001 bike plan cut. You're not really uh, still responding yet to the, uh, the, uh, the harms and crashes of where we're getting hurt, including the streetcar track hazards. Uh, you need to be especially careful with the maintenance. 
is. I'd like to see that baked into this official plan. Where there are streetcar tracks, you have to have exceptionally good maintenance and enforcement of uh, parking regulations. I could go on, but I think I'm out of time. Councillor Perks. I, could you guys do me a favor? Um, I'm, could you produce the draft, uh, the new draft language as a document by itself rather than amend paragraph two and replace it with subsection three? I, I just can't follow. Is that possible? Uh, yes, we can, we can produce that and post it. Thank you. That would be very helpful to me. That's it, Councillor? Okay. Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much. I just, with respect to the, the December 12th, 2018 stakeholder workshop, um, there's 26 stakeholders that you invited to participate in, in reviewing some of the language and the direction of the new policy. Uh, I'm just curious to know, uh, because it says that only 14 of those stakeholders actually attended, was there another way to communicate with those stakeholders did, who did not attend so that their feedback could still um, uh, be gathered in a, in a systematic way to inform the process? Through the chair, we uh, shared all the, the uh, materials from that meeting with everyone who was invited and uh, gave them the opportunity. That was a, 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 a committee or a, a group of stakeholders that represented a cross-section of major, uh, major interest groups related to transit and cycling and the transportation policies. Understood. And with respect to um, the, the groups that were then responding, uh, how many of them actually provided written responses, not just the ones who attended? Uh, I'm sorry, off the top of our head, we don't have the number of written responses. We did take things back, uh, detailed notes at the meeting, and, and also copies of uh, marked up uh, comments from the participants at the meeting. Okay. Um, I'm just curious because there are organizations such as Sistering, which is a 24-hour women's drop-in centre, uh, as well as the Toronto Women's City Alliance, which actually has been defunded by the city. Um, and they don't have full-time staff. Um, just curious to know how many of how how many women's voices uh, were included in the feedback, pertaining especially with respect to um, the vulnerability of certain road and transit users and the issue around safety and how we actually design new transit transportation systems with their um, uh, needs in mind for the future. Through the chair, uh, attachment 10 includes all of the written responses we received, and it included at least two uh, specific from women cycling advocates. Okay, and was there any further uh, deep dive into in terms around safety, but with a with a lens around um, violence against women, of uh, trying to design out street harassment, putting in that um, that component around safety back into transportation and transit um, design and implementation. So through the, uh, through the chair, we have included uh, in this some new pro proposed policies that relate to public realm around, uh, around transit facilities that would also deal with issues of safety and accessibility. So those, those issues are specifically addressed in the context of, of the proposed policies. Uh, did and, it go through a, sorry, did it go through a gender lens? Uh, a gender-based analysis? So th through the chair, there was not a formal gender-based analysis. There was certainly a cross-section of, of uh, participants at our meeting that reflected uh, a broad range of different perspectives. So I'm going to focus uh, again on the, the, the challenges of keeping certain road and transit users safe, especially those who are vulnerable. And this would go, I mean, obviously it would apply to women, but it would also apply to children. It would apply to uh, the elderly and people living with disabilities. And from what I can tell from the stakeholder discussions, there isn't, there isn't much 
um, from those sectors that are represented in this uh, particular um, uh, document so far. Um, it's, uh, it's still, I guess, early days, early enough days. There's still more consultation ahead. Uh, would you be agreeable um, to broadening this uh, consultation group? Through the chair, certainly we would welcome any suggestions on additional groups and uh, um, issues to, to consult about related to the transit policies. The other thing that I would point out is that uh, this, is, this is the high level policy framework and the other thing that the other initiative under, underway right now is through transportation services with the update of the cycling strategy, which is much more granular and would get into um, more specific issues around safety in the design of our cycling facilities. So this is being captured in different ways. But uh, again, we would, be, we would welcome suggestions on, on groups and approaches to consultation. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Uh, I do have one. Um, I was going through, when I was reading the um, uh, actually, council directions, I thought it was extremely interesting that back in 2015 we asked uh, planning and growth to develop an appropriate process to measure and monitor the cumulative effect of development on transportation congestion. congestion. We get these, these issues in every meeting we have about a new development coming to our communities. First question is, how about transit? How are you dealing with transit? So can you let us know very briefly, like what exactly is the process that you're dealing now um, and how does it feed into TTC, into, tra into planning, tra uh, transportation planning, um, and, and when I say TTC, not only the planning of new projects, but actually the day-to-day -day operations. How are you feeding this information? Uh, to the chair, uh, I'd answer the question, um, in terms of scale. So I think at a, at a development application scale, uh, the city requires uh, submissions with those development applications, as you'd like to be aware, traffic impact studies and associated um, work that uh, measures the, uh, the impact, the transportation impact of that particular proposal. That information is shared with the TDC, transportation services, and depending on where you, in, where you are in the city, that's evaluated to determine um, the impact on that particular site and neighborhood. Uh, it is very much on our radar through city planning and transportation services to be aware of the cumulative impact in those particular neighborhoods. I would say as you scale it up into a secondary plan area, for example, such as Don Mills and, and uh, Golden Mile that we had this morning, we're looking at those issues, overall congestion, transportation, um, demands, vehicular, all modes, through that neighborhood scale lens. So those issues very much part of, uh, for example, Golden Mile Transportation Master Plan would come along and is coming along with Golden Mile. Um, and then finally, at this scale, the citywide scale, this sets the overall expectations of how we, um, how we manage the, the, uh, the policy framework for the city and how we shape all of the uh, tactics that we employ, various tactics. Um, one piece of work that's in the middle between a lot of, a lot of those tactics and the, and the high level policy is uh, work that we're doing with the TDC and transportation services on a mobility strategy. We're looking at some of the issues that you're raising around what we can do to better inform and measure uh, our performance, the city's performance on, on uh, transferring people to different modes, on the actual impacts that we're having on people in communities. So that's some work that's currently underway that we're uh, trying to develop uh, that has been done. It's similar to transportation master plan, but so it's similar right that, now, to work that's been done in other cities. But right now we don't have data that says, you know, this corridor can sustain these many uh, riders and these are the modes of transportation so red flag goes in because we're approving way too many developments way more than we have nothing so, here to, i know but we have to the chair i mean the the uh the difference between water infrastructure and transportation infrastructure is that 
you know which direction the water is going into and out of the building, and it's always going in the same direction. With the transportation network, people use it in so many different ways, and they use one mode on one day to get to one place and a different mode in another day. So it's, it's not quite the same sort of capacity uh, constraint issue that we are dealing with, uh, not that there aren't capacity constraint issues, but the other thing that the official plan talks about is encouraging uh, encouraging more um, active and sustainable transportation and also looking at our network to move more people through the same infrastructure, which is why there's such an, in, an emphasis on public transit in order to be able to that's, move it's more It's almost people. like telling me that it's impossible to plan, to plan for a good transit network because people are going to use it in different ways all no, the time. The, the, so, so that wasn't what I was suggesting, through, um, Madam Chair. What I was suggesting was that, or what I would respond to that is that we do need a very well-developed transit network that provides options and a fuller build-out of the network so that people have those different choices about how they get around and that the network, the transit network, provides them many different ways to get to where they need to so go. So what, what I don't get from this, and I know that my residents don't get as well, and I think a lot of people in the communities don't get, is the um, assurance that we are really integrating transportation and planning, and that, you know, at what point are, are we approving these developments and saying, we will have the capacity, or in order to have the capacity, these things have to happen. People never see that. They don't see that, that connection between the two. So, um, it's, it's so I, I think a good answer is in the Don Mills Crossing um, secondary plan that we just, uh, that committee just addressed. There is uh, a plan that builds out the street network and builds out active transportation corridors in that. There's also a monitoring program built into that secondary plan that as development is progressing, we are looking at uh, how, how does our plan work? And, and also, as certain things are built out, like uh, the, the potential of a relief line north extension, what does that do in terms of uh, the, the uh, opportunities for development or the capacity in that area? So, so that's a very concrete example of, of, of a, where we are doing and that's or great. will be doing I just that. don't understand why we need a secondary plan for that to happen, and that is not happening straight from official plan since we are. Um, why do I need to do a secondary plan in order to guarantee to my residents that that is happening? Well, they may, uh, they may be experiencing congestion as it stands today or, or difficulty with the street network as it stands today. Uh, we're doing a secondary plan in those areas that we saw this morning because we are anticipating growth of tens of thousands of people and a new transit line under construction. Uh, that transportation master plan that, can, that comes with Golden Mile um, assesses the number of people and jobs that are coming to the area and tries to evaluate the, the capacity associated with the different modes and tries to lay out a road and public realm network that will support that demand. So we are trying to be as scientific as we can be, laying out a street network. And we did it in the Portlands, we've done it uh, in a lot of areas where we are actually trying to measure the demand and measure the supply, if you will, a public space that we need to move people around. Uh, it is very fluid. There are concepts like latent demand. Things evaporate overnight around the city or they, they accumulate overnight, as we all know. Um, we are applying as much science as we can to something that is often fluid and dynamic. Okay. Councillor Perks. So, sorry to belabor this, but it does raise a couple of issues. So, for example, I know that in parallel to this, uh, we're responding to the provincial changes in planning about intensification around uh, transit stations, right? That's correct. So I, I could make a reasonable case that we have no spare capacity uh, on the northern parts of the uh, Young Line. I refuse to call it Line 1. Um, <laughs> Like you, you know, we're we're full in peak hours south in southbound on that line. So at what point? Like I know that uh, in some planning circumstances, we we have uh, triggers, right? So uh, 
there has to be adequate park space, there has to be adequate school space. There's, when we review an application, we say, no, you, you, the, the, the infrastructure isn't here to support it. How are we going to tie that kind of thinking, this provincial requirement around transit stations and the plan that's in, the, the official plan amendment that's in front of us together so I can actually get on the Dundas bus in the morning, for example, or the Dufferin bus. do that work. This is the part that bedevils us as elected officials, and I need your help because you're planners. So through the chair, uh, very mindful of this, uh, the point that's being articulated. Certainly, um, the former Planning and Growth Management Committee, uh, uh, it was a hot topic as well. Uh, the, the effort is, as you say, to conjoin land use planning and transportation planning and more broadly infrastructure planning. So that was the experience of TO Core and Midtown in Focus, yes. was to come up with much more disciplined, rigorous infrastructure strategies that support the growth, to pace the growth yes. uh, so that when we are growing by pick a number 10,000 people that we had planned in the capital budget for that community center and so on and so forth down the line. The, the trickiest part of the infrastructure puzzle is likely transportation because of the sheer cost, especially with regional transportation infrastructure. Uh, the sheer cost of and, and the time it takes to implement uh, regional transportation. We can make a lot of changes to local mobility networks. We've experienced improving sidewalks, adding bike lanes, improving streetcar lines. So we can do a pretty good job improving the utility of our streets, and that's what Complete Streets is all about. Yes. Squeezing as much juice as we can out of what we got. But at some point, I would agree with you, there are going to be limits to the way this city grows, and the question is increasingly being called about how far we can get ahead or, or continue to grow and approve development before we've got some very, very difficult choices to make so, around how much farther we're going to go. So I'm wondering, as, as we go through the final round of consultation in this, I think, and again, I may have missed it because I couldn't follow all the pieces that were being moved around from one section to another. Is it conceivable that somewhere in our transportation policies, it says um, development applications or, or growth will be reviewed against whether or not uh, the transportation infrastructure in place can accommodate mm -hmm. additional growth. I mean, to, you know, my experience is the only thing we really look at is does the nearest intersection have the capacity for cars to go in the peak hour? That's about the only hard measurable I've ever seen on a development application. Uh, so through, the, through this, the chair, we have done that in secondary plan areas. I know, for example, and just drawing from memory, that we have put um, caps, if you will. So Sherway secondary plan, off the top of my head, I know it has a level at which holds are triggered on further development until a complete uh, rethink is done of the transportation capacity in so, the area. So I'm glad it's happened on the secondary plan. The question I'm asking on a citywide level is, I mean, perhaps could you consider as we go through the final round of consultation on this, whether having language in the OP that says, uh, you know, uh, growth will be measured against the existing capacity or the the committed capacity where we've got money allocated of the transit network. Is that a thing that would be reasonable to put in an official plan? Could you uh, think about it? But definitely in thinking about it as you're, as you're speaking, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, I think it's, you're, you're raising uh, uh, a significant but real challenge. And mm -hmm. the language what we've got in front of you right now is a package of proposed amendments to go out for consultation. Um, what you're raising is an additional thread, if you will, mm -hmm. to uh, consider as we, as we go forward. We'll look at it very closely. Okay. I just have to understand how it ties into what we've actually yeah, no, I know drafted it's a, to date. It's like a, it's 12 dimensional chess, these policies. So <sighs> That's if you, one way of putting it. Have it in mind. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, 
Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, just, uh, you know, I, I've talked to Death about Young and Eglinton for eight years and what's happening there and how disenchanted people are there. But um, my question is just on the transit file. L clearly, line one is um, completely um, at capacity, beyond capacity. <clears throat> and so I guess what specifically are you doing? Uh, what are you, uh, are you, how are you gain, getting input from that neighborhood? And I guess one of my questions would be um, Sarah is an impressive um, BIA, not BIA, Residents Association, Rapiers Association there, and they've done a lot of analysis on this. Have you ever met with them and seen kind of the numbers and stats they've pulled together on ridership and that kind of information yes, on through, this? Through the speaker, through the <coughs> Midtown Focus process, we worked very closely with Sarah and have been and continue to, to meet with them. This is really about consultation, so I won't, I won't ask it. I'm going to go off on another tangent on transit. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, speakers? Councillor Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I do have a motion to move, and thank you very much for the clerks for putting it on the screen. Um, and it's just number one to expand the, uh, the number of uh, individuals and points of view that are already at the stakeholder consultations. I recognize that uh, some of the work has been done. Uh, feedback has been collected, um, but as I scan that list, it really is missing uh, a number of advocates, uh, academic researchers, organizations whose primary focus is, is to promote accessibility, greater accessibility, and to do so with a, a, a gender-based analysis, especially around reducing violence, uh, violence against women, violence against children, and so the vulnerable road and transit users are always, in every city across the world, women, children, the elderly, and people with living, living with disabilities. And if we're going to be uh, changing the language and the, and the, um, and the structure uh, of the official plan as it relates to transportation and transport, I think that we can't move on without dealing with the lived experiences uh, and the real needs of those who are gonna be um, dramatically impact. Uh, majority of the transit users are women, um, the fact that we plan this, these systems where we don't talk about the greatest level of connectivity, we don't talk about violence against women, we don't talk about street harassment, we don't deal with um, some of the challenges around the, the bus shelters, uh, not, you know, being covered in advertisement today. Um, there has been good work at the city, but I think that it has largely fallen behind. Um, I know that it's, 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 it gets very confusing because you want to deal with it at the granular level, let's deal with it when we deal with the public realm. But it's also important to note that Toronto was a leader in this issue uh, back in the 1980s when, you when, when Art Eggleton, Mayor Eggleton at the time, mm -hmm. established the Safe Cities uh, Committee. And specifically uh, out of that moment in time uh, were innovative um, uh, policy and program moves that brought us the designated weight area that brought us um, the, the special request stops when the, um, the buses out in the suburban areas took too long and you were able to make a request off, uh, off the reg regular scheduled stops. All of that came from citizen participation and advocacy and spe specifically it came about because there was a forum, a formal process in the city of Toronto that allowed those experts to come to the, to, uh, to help us analyze the policies and to develop programs that actually would make a huge difference in people's lives. It's been, it's been some time uh, and it's been lost. And it's been very difficult because I think I've moved so many of these motions where I want us to just approach decision making at the city knowing that it has to be deal standard. That when, you, when we design cities and the build form and the, and the, and the, uh, and the environment, and all the different systems that move people um, and house people, we just have to center their uh, experience. Um, and when the whole world is having conversations around Me Too and Time's Up, and this building is entirely quiet, it's, it's actually quite alarming that perhaps we're not quite in touch with what's happening around street harassment and the fact that people keep, they are talking about it. There are. There are people who've actually had, um, uh, and this is just another example, um, you know, there's Muslim women who've had their hijabs ripped off. Um, 
in public spaces, in public transit, and there hasn't been an adequate response. I'm not saying that we need to do this overnight, but considering that this process began back in 2013 and we've gone this far is a little bit alarming. In 2016, I did move a motion, and I hope, uh, I think Jennifer Keesmat was still of our chief planner then, um, and Greg, I'm gonna just encourage you to pick this up. I moved a motion ask, asking specifically uh, for an update on the safe city guidelines. It's three years later, and we still haven't done it, and it specifically was trying to bring that discussion that began in the 1980s that developed great policies that made our, our, our systems and city systems safer for residents uh, in the 1990s um, is to actually take that and dust, us, that, dust it off and so that Toronto can be a leader on this issue again. We will get through the, the transit wars, I hope, um, with, a, with a system that actually makes sense. I know that we will have to get really smart and in front around uh, the automated uh, vehicle um, and the threats that that may bring. Um, I know that we are going to have big conversations mm -hmm. around transportation connectivity and the networks. Um, while we do all of that, uh, as we plan out how we move goods and services across the city and people, I just think that we need to dive deeper and really be committed to the fact that there are voices that are missing. And, uh, and it's not just around the cycling lanes. It's about how we actually design the system and the infrastructure that moves people and our goods and services. So I know you can do it, um, and uh, I'm going to help you along the way, um, but, but it means that you need to make a commitment to, to get it done. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wontem, any other speakers? Councillor Perks. So um, the topic of uh, uh, how scarce dollars are allocated to operating, uh, maintaining and expanding public transit is obviously live in everyone's mind. Um, the, the thing that, that is fascinating to me is the extent to which it has become utterly disconnected from uh, the actual demand for transit and the actual uh, growth in, de in, de in development and, and density. Um, I think that until we reconnect those two things, how money is allocated to public transportation and where the growth is actually taking place, uh, we and the region will fail and scarce dollars will be, sent, will be spent in the wrong place doing the wrong things, uh, meaning we'll have empty subway trains running back and forth on some line somewhere while uh, areas of the city fail because of the, the congestion in our transit system. I'm just waiting for the day when uh, a subway train is delayed and then a group of people panic on the platform and something terrible happens. So I think it's, it, we have to take this moment in this planning to make it very, very clear uh, to, to Torontonians, to other municipalities, and to the province of Ontario, that if we don't get this relationship right, the development industry fails, our gov local governments fail, and our money disappears chasing rainbows. So I, I'm, I'm very keen that in the next and final round of this conversation, we start to make it much more explicit in our official plan that development can only take place in parallel with investment, not just in infrastructure, but also in operations and rolling stock and all the other things that make a transit system go. Thank you. Any other speakers? Um, I would like to say uh, a few words. I was um, really intrigued with this recommendation from 2015, because like I said in my questioning, every development meeting that I go to, that is the first thing the community asks. And I think it is because they don't feel, they don't understand how we're doing this work, they're not confident we're doing this work, and it's creating unrest out there. And to be honest with you, I talk with a lot of people uh, about this issue, and uh, uh, the other day I reflected on this because I had somebody that, you know, very involved in urban issues, and it was telling me that, you know, there's a lot of education that we need to do out there. And uh, this was about the growth, the city needs to grow uh, by, and we all know, we need, we're growing by a million people in the next 20 years and we need to educate people. 
And I, I said, you know, maybe it's not so much about us educating them, but it's more about us educating ourselves and understanding more what is driving this opposition. What, why are people sometimes so against some of these things? And one of the things that I hear constantly is this relationship. They don't understand, they don't feel confident we're doing a good job in the approval of all this development that is happening, the growth that we're doing in the housing with the transportation network, with the development. And we haven't done, you know, a pretty good job in the past. I mean, I, we're very close to Liberty Village, and in the physical form of Liberty Village, everybody agrees it was great, but the transportation is not there. And so people continue to go back to these examples and say, we as a city need to do better. And we as a city need to make sure that we explain this better. If we want people to accept the growth that is coming, uh, to, to be supportive of this growth, we need to understand that the growth is not only on the bricks and mortars of, of the, the houses, but it needs to come with the services. And transportation is a huge, huge, big part of it. And people are already feeling the pressure in these systems. So, I do think that our official plan, our transportation study, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think, you know, seven, six or seven years ago, I don't think planning even had this much focus on transportation. So I think we're heading in the right direction. But I think we need to be even more clear um, with the processes that we're using and not just saying, yes, we're doing that in a secondary plan. It needs to be our official plan that needs to do this. The conversation, even for us, with, with the, the, the political side, with the TTC, and with the, 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 the planning and the transportation department, needs to be a lot more open and a lot more active and a lot more transparent to the public as well, so that they feel the confidence. So when we go out and talk about planning and talk about a new development, talk about the growth of our communities, they feel like we're addressing the different components uh, from you know the cycling network to the, the, the transit and, and the traffic to you know, the, the bricks and mortars in the buildings that are coming. So that was that. Yes. <laughs> you inspired me to speak for one minute. Um, yeah, I guess I just have to bring up Young and Eglinton and what's happened there and just watching for eight years the development ha activity and just no match, uh, no matching up of the transit services in the area. Whether it's north or south of Eglinton, um, most of it's east, not so much west, but it's just unprecedented what's happened there. And uh, I know a number of councillors are aware of it, but some still aren't. And I encourage people to go up to that area or to look at a map of what's being proposed, because it's going to be a crisis there. That's the only word for it. If it's not already, people are waiting several trains to get on peak hours, uh, not just at Eglinton, but also at Lawrence and York Mills. So. Uh, I think what the chair is saying is uh, right on the money, and uh, we have to do we have much we have to do a better job of of being proactive. So thank you for those uh, for this report. It's exciting. Thank you, Seeing Dan. That all those in uh, favor of uh, Councillor Wong Tan's motion. All those against. Seeing none. That carries. Uh, item as amended. All those in favor. And all those against, and that carries. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I have to go on a radio interview at noon, so I'm just not to interrupt this item. I will excuse myself since Councillor Robinson's here, and now you have quorum. So, thank you. Thank so, you. item 4.5, Committee of Adjustment, Panel Size and Structure, and we do have deputants, and we'll start with uh, Ron Jamison. Ron? Good morning, Ron. Thanks for joining us. Oh, good morning. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come and, and speak with you today. Um, there's a bit of a scramble for us to get uh, our deputation organized, uh, figuring out who has the time to come and who's going to write up what we're going to say. But uh, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Long Branch Neighborhood Association to offer some additional suggestions regarding the Committee of Adjustment Panel Size and Structure. Um, just by way of background, 
according to the city's own statistics and our direct experience, Etobicoke and Long Branch in particular has become ground zero for consent and minor variance applications in the city. Uh, over the nine-year period from 2010 to 2018, Long Branch has had 93 applications to sever residential properties, more than any other neighborhood in the city. We have three principal issues with the Committee of Adjustment that uh, we, we feel have an impact on the size and structure, uh, one of them being equal access to justice for residents, and I don't mean to uh, over-represent equal access and, and justice. Um, the size of the panel and the training they receive. Um, we'd like to maximize resident participation in the planning process, but because committee of adjustment hearings are normally held during what for most people is the working day, it can be challenging for people to take a day off to attend and participate in the hearings. Uh, for those who are not on salary, Taking a day off might mean that they're foregoing a day's income to do so. While on the other hand, for the city staff, the lawyers, the planners, uh, all of those people are being remunerated for their time at such hearings. Now we feel this represents an inequality in terms of access to justice by offering a disincentive for blue collar residents to participate in the planning process. We agree with holding the committee hearings at Etobicoke Civic Center because it has good access to roads, highways, has ample parking, which York uh, Civic Center really was not known for. And since properties in the Etobicoke area predominate on the agenda, it's very convenient for Etobicoke residents. We'd like to propose dispensing with a morning session and instead hold hearings in the afternoon and in the evening. In addition, we pro propose that the evening session be set aside as much as possible to hear consent applications. Now, consent applications are by far the most complex matters that the Committee of Adjustments are called upon to, to hear. And it's best illustrated by the fact that most of the consent hearings that we've been involved in uh, normally take between 45 minutes and an hour. By comparison, when they go to appeal at T-Lab, we're seeing and we're actually participating in T-Lab hearings that are going five to six days. Uh, we have uh, one that uh, we just finished day three on Monday and we had finished with the first witness. Currently, the consents tend to get pushed to the end of an afternoon session, and that's a time when everyone, including the panel members, is starting to get fatigued. And I don't think that creates a good environment for good decision making. By holding consent hearings in the evening, I think it will allow more residents to participate in these important matters without financial penalty, because it gets outside the working day. It also means that panel members will be probably and hopefully fresher and more alert to be able to hear the arguments and to render sound decisions. Now, while it may not be as convenient for the planners and the lawyers, they're still going to get paid for their time. Our preference would be for one hearing a month to ease the burden for residents associations such as ours. Um, we want to be actively involved in, in the process but we're also the ones who tend to be leading, organizing, and presenting uh, to committee hearings. And sometimes it, it's a, an issue for us because we may have a T-Lab hearing going on at the same time as a committee of adjustment hearing. So who's going to attend what? Um, if that's not possible, we'd recommend holding one hearing per month for Etobicoke matters and another hearing per month for York matters. Sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Okay. Um, we have concerns about training amongst the Committee of Adjustment panel members, uh, in particular with respect to the Long Branch uh, neighborhood guidelines, which were introduced last January. Um, we are now just seeing uh, applications come forward to the committee that will qualify for consideration under these but we have a sense that while the 
panel members have been provided copies of the guidelines. We don't think they've actually been trained on how to Thank interpret them. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of the deputant? Councillor Robinson? So I moved motion year, motions a few years ago about training, and so you're saying you feel that, that the training is not quite ac adequate at this time? Or? Yes, that's right. And um, in what way, I guess if you could just, what your thoughts are around that, I'm interested okay. um, on the training piece. Uh, so the, the Planning Act says that uh, committees of adjustment will, in their decisions, provide reasons for the decisions and, uh, and comment on the written and oral submissions made. Here are three committee of adjustment decisions from last year. Um, I apologize, maybe I've got two of these the same. Um, but you'll see that the wording is exactly the same. It's boilerplate text. We have one, uh, let's see, 99 27th Street, I believe, was one where the, the panel approved a consent application with a 0.92 FSI, which is nearly three times what the bylaw permits. And the explanation there of why that's considered minor doesn't really satisfy the residents. We, we really have doubts as, as to why that is considered minor. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and any, any other, so you're saying basically the written uh, submissions at the end are not adequate. They're, 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 they're not adequate, they're just uh, template type. That's right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Next deputant, uh, John Carlos uh, Sofildis. It's a joint presentation? Okay, so John and Paula. Yes. Luda. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good day, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Paula Tenuta. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Relations at the Building Industry and Land Development Association. With me today, I have John Carlos Silfidis, who is on BUILD's Board of Directors and Executive Committee and helps me with everything City Hall in his capacity as Chair of the Renovator Government Relations Committee. You should have correspondence in front of you um, that reflects um, our, our deputation today. Uh, with over 1,300 members, the BUILD is the voice of the land development, home building, and professional renovation industry in the GTA. And today we're here on behalf of the professional renovator members and our BUILD Renovator Council to address item PH 4.5, which speaks to the size and structure of the C of A. Um, it is important for this committee to know that BUILD's renovators have developed an excellent working relationship with both planning and building staff. And through the Chief Building Officials Renovator Roundtable, which planning staff do sit on, we've had a formal vehicle to address various industry issues in the interest of increasing efficiencies and everything renovation, and we have discussed the Committee of Adjustment on several occasions. BUILD is very supportive of city staff's recommendation to increase the number of panel members for the C of A, which would enable more hearing dates to be scheduled. As noted in the staff report, the volume of applications to the C of A has increased significantly in the last 10 years, which has resulted in a corresponding significant increase in the time of applications Paula, to be scheduled. I'm going to have to ask you to stop. We just lost quorum. Oh, if, Rob, can you go chase? Uh, stop the clock. Oh, okay. Stop the clock. Okay. Just uh, we just need to wait a few minutes. That's fine. Sorry. Would you like us to leave? No. <laughs> I'm good, how are you? <laughs> Is this live too? <laughs> this is That's just okay. like a committee of adjustments hearing. You wait <laughs> three hours for two minutes. Do they stop you? <laughs> don't go anywhere. I don't remember where I stopped talking. <laughs> I think it was here. See, when their clock went 50, I'm getting yeah. okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
So are the Leafs going to win the Stanley Cup? No? <laughs> no, you've lost all the hockey players. Too. No hockey fans? Oh my you're, you're still on TV, eh? Everyone's watching us from the office right now. Really? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Paula. Sorry about that. No, that's okay, thank you. Um, I think I left off by saying that the Build Renovator members have been expressing their concern on the time it takes to schedule a C of A hearing, and that's why we're taking the opportunity today to ask this committee to consider even more ways above and beyond what the staff report recommends to streamline and increase C of A efficiencies. And I think now over to my colleague, John Carlos, to elaborate on some of our recommendations. Thanks, Paula. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to address you today. Uh, we believe the staff report's recommendations are a step in the right direction. It's no secret that the CAA is not meeting service standards we should expect, and we can and must do more. First off, we at BUILD would suggest that this is an opportune time for the Planning and Housing Committee to direct staff to take a more detailed and comprehensive review of the application process and to examine the feasibility of a separate screen for less complicated COA matters. It makes little sense to hold hearings involving more contentious planning issues, such as how many stories a particular high-rise development should be permitted, alongside truly minor variances, such as side yard setbacks or the size of a rear deck. Many of our members, and clients for that matter, wait for hours to be heard at committee meetings after waiting for months for a date, only to have their item dispensed with in mere minutes. It would be in the interest of efficiency and improved service delivery to start looking at ways to create different streams for COA matters so as to enable the less complicated ones, and I would suggest most renovation items, to be processed in a timeline that respects the provisions of the Planning Act, that being 30 days. None of us want to keep our homeowners waiting for more than they need to, and this would be a step in the right direction. This leads to my second point. We are recommending that this committee ask staff to report on the types of variances being presented to COA and then to make a determination as to why. If there is a commonality and an abundance of the same type of variances, then perhaps it would be time for the city to examine different options to address these applications. We have already suggested one, and that's to create a separate stream, but we might have to examine the zoning bylaws themselves. As an example, in the old city of Toronto, prior to bylaw 569, if you wanted to do an addition to your house, a rear addition, you can build it in line with that house, even if that house didn't respect the setback requirements. No variance was necessary. Today, it is. As you know, the infill and construction and renovation industry has now eclipsed the new home industry in terms of size and economic impact. In fact, we are larger than the auto industry. In the City of Toronto alone, last year the industry generated almost $6 billion in investment value, created over 55,000 jobs, paying about $3 billion in wages. We are a significant economic driver of the City, and with your help we will continue to be so. Our members that build are the professionals in the industry who don't run away at the first sign of an inspector. We are, uh, we are proud of the constructive working relationship we have with the City, 
And though we may have uh, a minor variance in vision from time to time, we're very proud of the work we do and the cooperative uh, manner in which we work with the city. So let's serve the interests of our clients, the homeowners of this great city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of the deputants? Seeing none. Thank you so much. Questions of staff? Uh, I do have a question of staff. So um, do we keep track of uh, these variances? So do we do regular analysis of, you know, the kind of variances, how often they're coming, how we're dealing? Uh, back to you, Madam Chair. We actually do keep those stats. And we have previously commented on that before by way of memo to members of council, but that was years ago. So we do know. Um, we periodically, every few years, do a run on what are the type of variances that the committee is receiving, and yeah, we have a pretty good handle on that. So it is, um, if it's the will of the committee to share on that work with you, to look at that and, and hear your recommendations on some of that, um, you would think you would support something like that. Yeah, we haven't done a, a run for a couple of years, but yes, we oh, it might be time we to do report it. back. <laughs> and I'd, I'd also add that um, oftentimes that would lead to uh, consideration of zoning bylaw amendments. So, for example, in uh, the harmonized bylaw, uh, a lot of the foundational research on recommendations for changes to zoning originate with research that we do on the history of variances. Yeah, and certainly that would involve community consultation. And uh, example, West Forest Hill, we did an updated zoning study, but we did the research at the committee, the committee find out, okay, what's happening with those side yards, what's happening with the density patterns to normalize or right size the zoning provisions, hopefully reduce the number of times people go to the committee in a way that the community is aware of and comfortable with. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, why, I have a number of questions for you, so I'll ask them very rapid fire, but why don't you shift to the evening? I mean, I hear this complaint all the time, and we heard the first deputant talk about that. Through you, Madam Chair. There was some hearings in the past that were evening scheduled. That was changed in all districts to only day schedule for two main reasons. And uh, that's been previously reported on. One was that because we're trying to deal with the backlog and the average hearing has roughly between 35 and 40 items, it actually takes all day to go through the agenda. So to start it in the evening, we wouldn't finish the agenda. Secondly, we were having trouble with availability of panel members and staff going into the evenings. Okay, and I moved motions again a few years back on, well, a whole whack of them on COA, but one was the training, and uh, I remember there's an odd report that came back on that, but again, such a critical piece of the, the effectiveness of this body. Uh, what is happening on training and what can we do to make them, uh, the, the panels more effective? Through you, Madam Chair, we, we have actually uh, ramped up the amount of information we provide to the panel members and we have been scheduling more hearing, um, more uh, training dates. In fact, on March 5th, Myself, Sarah, all the Deputy Secretary Treasurers met with all of the 25 members of the C of A and had a session, a knowledge sh uh, sharing session. The next one we want to schedule is for when we bring on the new panel members, which are scheduled, we hope, to start September 1st, first week of September. Okay, and then um, just on the number, the numbers, I always had, had heard uh, multiple times that my ward, Councillor Fillion and Councillor Cole, those three were the top of COA applications in the city. Is that, is that a fact? Is it a fact and does it remain true? Those are the top, top three in the city? Through you, Madam Chair. I don't have in front of me uh, the data by ward. We have it by okay. district. We have up-to-date information. Can we get that at some point? Absolutely. That would, be, that would be amazing to see that. And then last question is I'm going to call follow the leader. Um, there's, uh, you know, a tendency from what I, the feedback I get is there's one kind of prominent person on the COA who does their homework and does the proper analysis, visits the site. And then there's a tendency, and this is just what I've heard, so I don't know if it's actually true, that the rest of them just kind of follow that kind of the guidance of that individual or their position. 
Is that is there a trend? And maybe that's just North York, but is there a trend toward that, or and how do we correct that? Through you, Madam Chair, my own observations, of, and I've sat in on many panel sessions. Is first of all, there is a chair of every panel, and the chair takes that leadership role, and so you often find that they do more of the dialogue back and forth with applicants and residents appearing before that committee. But you have to keep in mind, every member appointed by council to the C of A is independent and provides their own decision. My, my observation is I, I wouldn't agree with your comment that there's a follow the leader approach. There just may be some that are quieter than others on the panel. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Speakers? Sorry, we, that's, we're, we're past that point. <laughs> uh, speakers? Uh, no? I do have a motion, <clears throat> and I want to thank staff for the work that, uh, that they've done. Um, but I do agree that, uh, you know, we should always be looking at ways to improve. And since the analysis is being done, I would like to have that coming to this committee with your recommendations to see uh, if there's any further work that needs to be done. I think the, the it, it would be helpful for the committee to understand, especially if the analysis hasn't been done now for a couple of years. Uh, and, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing back. And I hope the committee supports the recommendation. Uh, Yes. I have a question, just a procedural one. Is this for Portfolio Council? Or is it, is it that, is it for the area that you want to have? Yes, sir. That's why I just asked. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, what uh, what I heard was that, and, and I, I think uh, it happens a lot in the downtown, uh, there's very complex applications that end up as well in committee of adjustments. So you have a homeowner that is waiting for a variance on a setback uh, that gets to the front of the line and gets this patched in two minutes after having to wait sometimes hours and hours because those complex applications are being, you know, they're all mixed up. So. Is there an opportunity to have different times maybe for issues that are not as complex as others? I think it's worth the conversation. Uh, I don't have the answer. I think those, that's, I'm looking forward to having feedback and having the analysis of staff. Um, I think it's, it's worth them looking at, at this. I think it's good feedback. And the second one is all the variances. I think that, that staff do this. I, I, I've asked staff, do you do an analysis of all the variances and are there things that we should be looking at? They do. I think the committee should be uh, informed uh, and have an opportunity to look at the, that analysis and, and, some feed, and, and some feedback from staff on, on if there is anything that could be done on some of those variances so we don't have, if, if, if all these people are going to committee of adjustment on a variance that we know happens all the time and that is taking so much time Maybe it's time that we have a discussion and look at it if it needs to be changed or not, and, and we have a conversation with our staff and with the public. Obviously, these things are, are done in a public way. I just think that the, com the committee should be part of this work, and that's why I'm, I'm asking it to have it report back in here. And I wonder, what would this separate screen look like, like different times of day? You see the same it, it could be, like, I, 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 don't ha I don't pretend to have the answer. I'm asking our staff to have the conversation. I think they're the experts, and I would, would like to hear from them, them on that. There has been, I, I acknowledge that there is a, an issue. I have, you know, a lot of the residents sometimes feel very frustrated having to wait hours and hours at Committee of Adjustments to have their variance heard for two minutes and then <laughs> go home. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there something that we can do on that? I'm, I'm looking to have staff uh, uh, working with stakeholders on this and, and advise us if, there's, if, if there is something that makes sense to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Councillor uh, Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you very much and thank you for the motion. Um, I'm curious because, uh, and, and this re might require some feedback from staff, um, planning staff um, don't always uh, provide statements nor take positions on minor variance applications. And so by way of even trying to disaggregate and pull 
and, and pull down a, um, a, a breakdown or a, a sorting of categories of applications, uh, is the motion intended to ask staff to start taking more formalized positions at the CFA? Otherwise, how would they, because they don't usually say anything at all. Um, if, uh, if they don't object or, or perhaps if they sometimes they, object, they, they, they oftentimes say we don't have a position. And so how will they then determine? I, I think it could be done the, at the, different the points in time. Of, when you do a PPR and you do your variances, it could mm -hmm. be done at that point in time. I, again, I, I, I don't want to micromanager the program that could, they could work. I'm, I'm just thinking it could be done at the PPR stage. It could be done at a, a planning. I, I, I will leave it to staff to report. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, there is a cursory overview done by the Deputy Secretary Treasurer of all the agenda items that are before them to be scheduled over the next many sessions. And they do make an attempt based on feedback correspondence coming in, whether community planning has reported or not, a rough degree of how complex perhaps that application might be or how difficult it might be before committee, and they do try their best to batch them. Generally, we lean towards the more simpler, what we think will be the more simpler applications at the beginning of the meeting, more complex consents towards the end. So there is some of that triaging that is occurring already. So that's good to know. I didn't realize that that was already happening. Um, so I guess you're, what, you're, what the motion will th then do is to formalize that process and to bring it up to, to some level of public accountability and discussion back to this committee. Yeah. Because um, I, I had no idea that you guys were already trying to batch it. Um, and, um, and do you also, as you're trying to uh, sort of put them in categories of similarities, is it also uh, based on controversy? Like sometimes there's more deputations, more uh, you know, uh, expert witnesses, more testimonies. It, do, you, do you then backload that? or uh, So you can sort of move the, because we're also dealing with backlogs. We're dealing with time spent at the committee trying to move things along. Is that also part of the consideration? And if, and if not, will it be part of the consideration moving forward in, by way of this motion? Through you, Madam Chair, not dissimilar to committees, other committees of council. Uh, knowing how many pieces of correspondence are coming and calls to our offices, we certainly get a sense of what might be controversial or long, and we amend the scheduling to accommodate when we think a lot of people might show up. Another important thing that happens is that all of our panels vet the agenda, similar to you running through the chairs here, running through the agenda at the start of the day to get a last minute or up-to-date understanding of what will generate a lot of time and effort during the day. Great, thank you very much, that's very helpful. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, could I have a vote on this? All those in favor? That carries. And uh, item as amended? And that carries, okay. And that completes our agenda, thank you.